Um, we you will know what I'll say. Well, I'll say yeah, you can totally. hide the excuse. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and I also, of course, Terry, although we are sorry to see you now. <laughs> I'm very pleased to see you too. And I may need your help at some stage. Okay. Yeah. I know you're on the change board. Yeah. Pretty good. It's good. It's good. Thank you. Whether, whether you can help me, whether you can help me. Well, it's probably useful for me to know. Point me in the right direction. I'll have a go, but I, it's probably useful for me to know if it comes up at the meetings. But I did have um, permission to go to the main street, but now they're saying no it's eight. Well, we, we know all about the uh, environment about agency. Yeah. Sometimes you, I think, that well, what's the order is say six. Yeah. They can run it. No, what about Trouble is, it is my building from eight. Yeah. 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 I sorted out, so I've got to be a little bit of 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 I need to go to to say I was speaking to Terry Lambert and he said I don't see a problem. Right. Thank you, Terry. <laughs> yeah, well done. <laughs> you say that. Oh, Mended. Oh, no, 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 And now we've got Sam. Right. I was going to say, he's going to do this. One more for you, if you. Maybe. <laughs> 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 This, Hello, is, this is something that was in. Um, so this was something that was. I've got something wrong with me, and they can't find out what it is. Oh, what's called it? Climate, that's right, and that cost for emergency supporting papers, saying that we were in the MC. And someone said to us, Yeah, I will. And I will support first of all. I think that might be more. So the other one as well. So, 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 
What can I say? Well, you can share my clothes soon. Oh, Sorry to be in No, you're not. You should... I just had to write down a Christmas order for Terry Nafferson. For a few shorts. Oh, yeah, How are you doing Christmas? This week? Yeah, it's a thing. Oh, 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 it's a thing. Because they all fall in line with that. Yes, yeah, so that's right. But does it matter that that's a private yeah. member's bill? But they get the campaign. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It doesn't matter. So, okay. so we can do that under the auspices of our declaration. Yeah, I agree. Okay. So I have to charge the entire state interview. You mentioned it in the first place. Nobody would get one. Yeah. They don't want to be on the same page. They don't want to be on the same page. They don't want to be on the same page. Uh, so you speak to it. I'll speak to last week at that point there. Yeah, okay. okay. I'll stop it for a while. I'll wait for a while. Yes. Later, later, later. Because we have a very good time. Yeah, we've been doing it. Already, it's already done. It's done. It's done. Two declarations by the emergency and ecological emergency. That's why it's a... So you want to... I think you want to mention those two modes. Climate emergency declaration. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Be better not on the on the arm. How are you anyway? Ecological emergency. Remember that. And those are the two, the ones that are really the ones that are 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 the ones so we're clear with that. Uh, yeah. 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 Yes. I'll yeah. say if the mayor is happy with this. Yes. Okay. And then you can actually ask for the council if you want. And I also find it. Yeah. I don't know. 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 I don't how are you doing, Nick? You, my darling, are <laughs> good. Brilliant. I've got a few times, I think. I need to switch my own. It's difficult. It's certainly so is. Like, I'm going to open it from over there, so... Be okay. I think uh, have a little bit of a small brand this evening. Yeah. 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 Uh, 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 my mother's still loads of them. Oh, I think yeah. it's probably something like that. My grandfather, 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 my Yes, yes, are we are we waiting for any other candidate? Well apparently this is an apology. According to I think I'm going to start. Don't worry. Mm. Mm. Yeah, Good evening, everyone. 
Uh, we're just about to start public participation. Uh, if you wish to speak to the council, uh, you will have filled in one of these lovely yellow participation forms. And if you would be happy to come to the council table when you speak, standing by the candle there to address the speakers, uh, to address the councillors and councillors. If one of you could turn a microphone around so that the person speaking could be heard. There's no fire alarm or fire drill tonight, so if we do hear a fire alarm, it is a real thing. If you can, go down the stairs that you came up. If that's blocked, there's a fire escape on this side. If they're both blocked, there will be an interesting evening. There's um, toilets are just out here, and there are other toilets downstairs, and of course there's a lift. If there is a fire, please don't use the lift. So um, that's parish news out of the way. First speaker I have on my list is John Davis, St Dunstan's Leisure Provision. Is John Davis here? We did have an apology. So I, um, next we have Andy Reid speaking about Manor House Community Garden. Do come up to the table. Good evening. Um, some of you may have heard of us or even visited the garden that we have at the back of our houses. Um, it's been a constant feature in various guises since 2000. Initially, even before that, it was allotments, which over time fell into disrepair. And the space had become completely overgrown and unusable. In 2018, the local community started working on getting it back to being a usable space. Lots of hard work from residents, with grants from Somerset Open Mental Health, Somerset Food, Community Food Growing and Glastonbury and Broom. Bloom, we now have a wonderful community garden. Now, those gardeners amongst us will know that any gardens are work in progress, and we are constantly trying to improve the space for the benefit of the community. What we've done so far, we've got a vegetable garden, we provide food for any locals that want to come and harvest it. We've started a herb garden, we've planted 100 hedging trees from the Woodland Trust, we've created a wildlife space, we've put up six bird boxes, have plans for more. We even have a statue made by a prominent local, local artist. This is a testament to the hard work, um, and we've been awarded third place for best community garden and highly commended for best wildlife gar life garden in this year's Glastonbury and Bloom competition. We're hoping to do better next year. By doing all these things, we're making a space that can enhance people's lives. There are friends and neighbours who are retired, working in the garden, and it provides a reason for them to get out and get in there um, and do some work. Others have medical issues. Um, waiting radiotherapy and hides the garden provides motivation and distraction from the worries of his imminent treatment. There are others who come out to find a quiet and peaceful space to meditate, and those who just enjoy the pleasure of gardening. We've held evening events at Equinox, Samhain, and recently a bonfire night, each one attracting between 20 and 30 local people, from small children to those of us who aren't so young. All in all, it's used by many for varying reasons. We all end up working together or just chatting and feeling better about ourselves and life in general. Our worry is that when the transfer from MDC to the new Unity Authority based in Taunton takes place, this amazing place in Spain will turn into just another piece of potential land, building land on a map. So on behalf of all of us here, I'm to, here to ask if the town could approach MDC to request that this wonderful asset be transferred to the town council to preserve it in perpetuity before this could happen. I believe there may be some precedent in this with the Jubilee Park. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Now, it's not customary for councillors to respond to um, public participation, um, but I did see that the clerk nodded when you that said that your suggestion, so we'll leave it there. Um, thank you for speaking be, without uh, going over three minutes. If the rest of the speakers could follow that example, that would be wonderful. Next, we have Tanya Moore from the Community Network. Oh, I promised that, Your Worship. <laughs> Sorry. Good evening, everyone. Hello. There's a couple of posters. I'm just going to stand down here, shall I? That's a bit better, isn't it? No. Okay. 
We can still, we can hear you, Tanya, when you stand up. Can you? I can't. So, I saw Councillor Tucker today. I don't know how many of you went to the climate emergency meeting. Uh, really good from um, Melissa, Melissa Taylor, all of her hard work. And when we were talking, one of the biggest things that comes from it, and the same from the volunteer network, is cohesion and groups working together and connecting people. And in terms of going forward with the climate, one of the things we need more than ever is locals. Everything on locals. Projects, community garden, local volunteering. Uh, from the volunteer perspective, the way we do it is having local volunteers support local residents. So if a resident needs a prescription, there's a local volunteer that could do it instead of someone getting in their car. So we want to be reducing everything. From that, wherever those two posters have gone, Councillor Henderson, uh, the op shop is all about local jobs, and I'm here to let you know that the op shop is not going to be closing. So Serena's already aware of that. It's not closing. It's going to be opening fully in the new year. So for now, it's closed temporarily on a temporary basis just due to COVID because, like all of us, COVID completely messed with us. And we're recruiting volunteers. There's going to be... That poster, by the way, is also in the window of the op shop. So for anyone else, we couldn't print off enough for everybody. But if you've got the chance to go by the op shop, there's still all the latest local jobs scrolling on the website. That's being updated every week. More have been added today. That's available on the website and on the notice board outside the op shop. People can put in their comments and suggestions in the... Have I gone over three minutes yet? And... And... They can put in their comments, their suggestions into the op shop letterbox or they can email. So we're going to be recruiting volunteers at the moment. There's going to be an MVQ level two, level three course for free for volunteers to learn information, advice and guidance on how to interact with the public, safeguarding support and delivering support in the community with local jobs and help back to boosting the economy in terms of keeping everything local. So that's the main message, keeping it local, keeping it open. I went to Burns of Bread today. I don't know if you saw they've got a job vacancy if anyone wants to work in Burns of Bread. But they didn't realise that the op shop actually advertised for local companies, for local jobs. So I'll come and see you tomorrow, see if you've got any job vacancies tomorrow. For the business, not that I would do that. But it's about all businesses knowing about the op shop. So if you know anyone who's got a business, please let them know to advertise with the op shop. Then it will be first put forward to the local people and then anyone else that wants to come and move to Bastonbury. But first, let's get the locals employed. Let's get the locals into volunteering. From my personal perspective, I really want to see as many locals volunteering and getting them engaged and involved again. The way we do that is having a hub, community hub, that people can go to. So linked with that, my final point is the op shop will also be available for hire for community groups. So I was talking with Serena and a couple, not Serena, sorry, Melissa today, and about different possibilities of groups, subgroups that will be able to hire the op shop as an information hub, whether it's for mental health or climate or support, so that it is also a place where people can drop into. So Going forward is open. If anyone's got any suggestions, if any council's got any suggestions, please email or go on the website, glassbyopportunities.org, or admin at glassbyopportunities.org, or post a postcard through the door, say, hello, nice to see you. Here's my suggestion. If you've got a suggestion, please let us know. There you go. Have I gone past three minutes? Well, you, Andy only used two of his, so... Okay, can I tell you a story? You, yeah, you've already, you've already used his extra one, I'm afraid, but there we are. Thank you, Tanya. That's great news, and well done to everything you do. Claire Rosalie Burke, Travellers' Rights. Right, again, I'm going to have to be very, very careful on how I word things. I have three things that I need to say. One is why. Number two is where. Number three is how. Now the why is, why aren't things being done? Why are promises being met? 
and why aren't things being put into place before more evictions go ahead. I have now lost my support network caravan for the people because I have my caravan down on what we call Alchemy Alley. And on the corner where the recycling place is, we call that Pooh Corner. Down by the zigzag building. We've all had notices put on that land. How many more have to be put in before the winter? Why? Because we've now got even more suicides happen because people have lost their homes. I've had two happen in the past two weeks. That's that one. The how is how are we going to progress here? Where's the money gone that's been promised? Now, this goes back to 2013 and beyond. Now, I'm not saying this is all down to Glastonbury Town Council because it's down to Somerset and to mend it. You have promised land, you have promised places to be put in. 88% of local town councils are not meeting public rights for sites. Glastonbury supports a lot of people that come from around the world. So let Glastonbury Town Council be the 12% that supports the community. Because these, like I said before, a lot of the people in this community go back centuries. And there's big names in this country that work this land. That's horse agricultural people, farmers, one being the Sweet family, the other being the Smith family. So that's that one. Right, how? How do we progress? Now, by his mouth. Okay, we get good and bad in all communities. But by his mouth, right, Common Moor Drove. We were promised that maybe there could be permaculture put in for job opportunities for travellers and local people and Romanese up on Bridie's Mount and to keep the field as a whole and turn it back to where it needs to be. Now you're thinking of putting in a car park, ruining a beautiful field that has got full of wild meadow flowers and wild bees and nature. So why turn it into a car park? Why can't you turn it back into something natural? Because you've just had the economical environmental thing today. Why not turn it back to what it was and get local people within the travelling community to look after it? That was one of the proposals. Can we not go back to that? Now, four of you voted for your land on Common Moor Drove before that eviction went in on Bridie's Mound for a travel site to be put in on Common Moor Drove. We needed six votes. We had so much hope that we could have something done before the winter. And now people are struggling, they're panicking. We've got mental health issues. Again, people don't know what to do. People are planning to move, people are planning to try and find other sites. And then we cause even more problems because they're going to Cinnamon Lane, they're going on to Benton Ox Way again. So we've got a bigger problem, where do we put people? So, I then found an article on Glastonbury Nub News. 90 houses being proposed. And guess where? Common Moor Drove. Well, there comes in my why again. Now, I spoke to environmental people today and I worked in horses. You don't have to put in drainage. You don't have to raise the land. Now, if they're doing it elsewhere, 20 plots, 30 plots, that's your community. They all work together. All you need to do is put on that caravan plot, a bit of gravel, a bit of compost out, like shavings, on top of that, wooden planks to where the tires go. 20 individual plots and it composts down. Every six months you move it two foot, put your planks down, put your caravan on top. So you're not actually putting concrete down and not causing a problem because everything goes back into the ground. So, you don't want to spend loads of money. 
because apparently we've got 1.41 million pounds being allocated for travellers' sites. Thank you very much to the government for that. But I would like to see some of that money being spent. Because I don't want to lose any more people. I don't want to see any more evictions. And it's all going through the government at the moment. I thank FFT for what they're doing. I thank the band. I thank the councillors. I thank the town, town members and the government for the support that we've had through FFT. Because we're now, through the FFT, getting our health care looked at. We're getting our rights back in each individual doctor's surgery so we can actually get some health care. Because a lot of people who are not getting health care over COVID. Not that some people want the injection, some people don't, but at least they're being given the option now. And once again, please, please look into where these evictions are going ahead. You're part of MAG. Please communicate between the different departments and find out where they're going in before you evict any more people before winter. And also, I have a suggestion to Mendip District Council, to Somerset County Council and to Glastonbury Town Council. I'd like you to elect two of your councillors specifically to go in and work with the travelling gypsy community. They are not bad people. Negotiate, come up to some compromises, but start speaking to people before these evictions go in again. They need help. They're part of your community. Let's see a change. I've been coming for months here. I would really like to see a change. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Councillor Henderson. Thank you, Claire. Uh, Claire, but don't mind me just speaking a bit. You come here every month and you're very uh, passionate about your speeches, and I appreciate that. But I, I, there is a lot of misinformation in there. So if you don't mind, I think what we need to do, if you wouldn't mind writing down some questions, and come and see me over there. We'll go through them one by one, and I can tell you what's happening with regard to money, with regard to land, and therefore you've got a clearer picture of what's actually happening, not what you may have been told is happening. Is that all right? I'll be there on Friday. I'll be there all day Friday, all day Saturday. I'm there all day Monday and Tuesday. No, in the shop. Okay? Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Uh, we now have Sam Dance, local planning. Good evening. I've jotted it down quite quickly to try and keep it succinct. <clears throat> it was drawn to the public's attention just a few days ago that there has been. It was drawn to the public's attention just a few days ago that there has been a planning application submitted to Mendic District Council for six dwellings on the green land on fields off Ashwell Lane. I believe that these are what might be described as luxury townhouses. The application was received by Mendic on Wednesday the 6th of October, and yet residents of Glastonbury and visitors do not appear to have become aware of this at all until three days before the deadline for comments. A very small number do seem to have seen it, but hardly anybody at all, and recently. Apparently, this application was not discussed at Glastonbury's recent town planning meeting. Possibly at none of them, I don't know. It seems extraordinarily odd that it wasn't, given that this is at the foot of the world-famous Glastonbury tour. Just days before the end of October, the public became aware of a planning application for a 20-metre 5G mast. The application was submitted on the 25th of August to Mendic District Council, and yet no one seems to have known anything about it. Indeed, at October's Town Council meeting, Mendic Rep Liz Latham stated that she knew of no plans for 5G, a 5G mast, in Glastonbury. Today, I've discovered that land at the Common Moor Drove has outlined planning permission for the erection of up to 90 dwellings with associated infrastructure. This is on the floodplain. 
Mendip has already fulfilled its housing criteria. The application was apparently received on Thursday the 28th of October and it was validated on the same day. Why was this on, not on Mendip Council's website beforehand? It was mentioned in a, no, a local news website last week, but on an extensive search on Mendip's website, it did not appear to be there. Nobody knew about it. It seems to have appeared today, just today. I would like to know if Glastonbury Town Council knew anything about this. Because again, it seems extraordinary that it was not discussed at the recent planning meeting. If you do a relatively simple search of predicted climate science, it is, uh, there are maps showing that that land will be underwater by 2050. Any architect knows that building on a floodplain is simply madness. I would suggest and I would like to ask that the tis, this town council voted in by many to protect this sacred land, this area of outstanding natural beauty, would organise, please, a method of informing the residents of Glastonbury really well in good advance about significant planning applications on the landscape that otherwise remain as good as hidden on Mendix's website, if they are even there at all. I will add that the long banded about field for the travellers remains elusive and yet constructs for wealthy property developers are handed out like sweets. Money has been promised for the travelling community, but there seems to be only the money for developers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. I see that um, <laughs> Councillor Coles wish to speak. I, the one thing I wanted to just reassure you, validation of a planning application is not approval of a planning application. It just means that effectively they got their papers in order. Any more experienced counsellor than I might wish to jump in and correct me, but I think that is the situation with regard to that. Um, councillor Coles. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, you're spot on about those 90 proposed housing development. That is on a floodplain. I've known about it for some considerable time, but I didn't know when the application was going to go in. Only six inches under the grass, the ground, is water. If you look around that field, you can see the rushes growing. And I've actually got video footage of that field absolutely flooded. If that gets passed, they raise the ground, and that will flood the allotment down the low side. Because there's, there's a rain there, but it wouldn't be able to take all the water if that land is raised up. So um, I shall be objecting most strongly when that application goes in. And uh, thank, you, thank you for bringing that to our attention. Well, thank you very much. The councillors should always be aware of predetermination. Uh, I'm sure you mean you may, but we, um, we have to, to look at it. So I'm just going to call one more time for John Davis in case John Davis has turned up. If not, thank you very much for public participation. <coughs> Councillor Smythe. I'd just like to reply to um, Samia's um, questions with regard to Asheville Lane and also the, the mast. Um, I shall be ha happily um, correct you on some misinformation at a later time. <coughs> thank you. So we're now going to move into the council meeting um, session properly, um, but before we do, I would like to ask Claire if you'd be kind to enough to light the candle for us. Lynn. Um, I noticed that there was someone at the beginning of the public speaking that uh, wasn't here, and I wondered whether I could say something since that wasn't there. Yes, of course, Lynn. Is that all right? Yes. Okay, I just wanted to speak about your leisure. Um, I, found, I only found out about your leisure because I happened to be taking my granddaughter to the tennis courts and it was on the gate, this was quite a while ago. And then a friend of my granddaughter's, her mother, lives with her 
backing right on to that site. And suddenly, I became aware of what they're going to do there. And I can't believe that that is going to happen. I thought that field was secured. I thought it had become a village green. I didn't think there was a possibility of this huge great football arena with astroturf and seating and barriers and lighting happening there. Um, how has this come about? I understand from speaking to Serena that Glastonbury Football Club has not actually lost its land yet and maybe would prefer to spend that money on enhancing its facilities that it already has. It's also suggested on a website that I only found today, a surf website, Sustainable Ecological Recreation Facilities, um, that um, uh, th there could be a possibility of it happening at St Dunstan School. But we have so little green land left for Glastonbury. That whole car park that is used to be Safeway and is now Morrison's, I understood when I first came here that there had been some agreement that it was a car park for the whole of Glastonbury. But no, suddenly it's now um, some some corporate scenario, it, that doesn't matter, but the thing is that the, the green land in Glastonbury is being swallowed up, and this football arena, who wants it? Is this really what the young people want? There's nothing in those proposals for the distribution, distrib distribution of the money that addresses the young people except this football ground. And I think this is not for the young people. This is for some sort of money-making scenario where people come in and pay to see what football clubs, but some football clubs or other, I don't know about football, playing on this land where it has been possible for as long as I can remember, um, not that long, only 20 odd years, but hey, um, but it's always been possible for the public to access this land. It's not been fenced off, it's not been enclosed, and it's not been astroturfed. AstroTurf is not a good scene at the moment. We want to avoid um, concreting, astroturfing, plasticating our land. Land is what actually absorbs the water. <laughs> it's true that that land floods and that, I guess, if they're going to make a football field there, they're going to have to somehow raise it up, make it above the flood. But that means that the flood will happen somewhere else. It's not a good idea and it's not what most people want, I don't think. I would be very pleased to know who actually wants this development and why they want it. And I would really request that the council look carefully at this application. Well, thank you, Lynn. Um, tonight on the agenda, item three, which will be yes. happening quite soon, will answer some of those questions that you've okay. raised and possibly um, clear up some of the information that you've seen. So the, the sports cluster are speaking tonight. So if you're happy to wait, you'll, you'll probably get a lot of answers for what you wanted. So uh, thank you very much, Sam. Claire, would you be happy to light the, the candle for us? And once the candle's lit, November is a time, of course, of remembering. And it is a time when we 
honor those who have passed over, particularly remembering those who have served this country. So I, when, the, when the light has, is lit, perhaps you will stand with me to observe the silent minute to remember all those who have served their country and lost their lives. <clears throat> Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. So we move to item one to receive apologies for absence. Joe, do we have any apologies? Thank you. Declarations of interest. Uh, any other? Uh, yeah, I believe Councillor uh, Brown. Thank you very much. Any other any other apologies? And I did speak to Councillor Lund today, and he um, how can I put this? He has laryngitis, so I don't think it would have been okay. suitable for him to come. Thank you. So, any declarations of interest, councillors, particularly in relation to the agenda we have before us this evening? I note that the town deal is on the agenda and I must declare an interest in the renewable energy project as I'm a director of Avalon Community Energy. So, so do you feel, Your Worship, that other councillors need to declare as does this house as a project? So, by the council? Yes, I, I also am a director of St Dunstan's House, which is one of the other projects. Any other councillors wish to make a declaration of interest? Councillor Henderson. I guess that we would have to do with the Macquarie Island Generation Trust then. Thank you. So, Councillor Henderson, Tucker, St Dunstan's House, and Brides Mound, and St Dunstan's House, John Keery. Thank you very much, Brides Mound, Serena Rondu. Thank you very much, councillors. Uh, if you note that you have an interest when we get to an agenda item, please do say to receive a presentation from the Town Deal Fund Sports Cluster led by Councillor Henderson. Councillor Henderson. Thank you, Chair. Evening, everybody. Um, we're here tonight with uh, some of the members of the Sports Cluster to uh, give you an uh, up-to-date sort of uh, where we are with the Sports Cluster bid in regard to all ledger. So, Lynn, if you'd... Uh, Listen, I mean, we, there's a lot of misinformation going around, so we're here to try and allay some of those fears and just say what we're actually trying to achieve for the town. Okay. I'll give you a bit of history. There was four initial expressions of interest submitted, and they were from Acro Edge Gymnasium, uh, Gym Acrobatics, Glastonbury Football Club, Wirral Park Bowls Club, and Fusion Lifestyle. Uh, the town's deal board brought all these four bids together to form the sports cluster, and they were there put into as one bid. The members of the sports club, a uh, sports cluster, have taken on the challenge of providing a multi-purpose facility which could potentially benefit all of Glastonbury residents, whether as a participant of sport, a parent or a relative or a participant, as a spectator, or as somebody just enjoying the health and well-being benefits of such a glorious open space in the middle of our town. To achieve this, the sports cluster is working closely with Mendip District Council, Fields in Trust, Sport England and other sport governing bodies. We have four of the uh, sports cluster um, members here and to give you a little bit of background on each of the um, stakeholders, they're going to say a, a little piece 
uh, from each of them. So if uh, Rob, if you'd like to step forward and speak on behalf of Fusion, that'd be great. It's a microphone there, Bob. Thanks, Steve. Good evening, everyone. Um, in 2019, the community of Glastonbury decided to protect the tall leisure fields by applying a fields in trust deed. The nature of that deed is to protect the land for sport and recreational use. Fusion's aspiration is to continue that ethos and that vision by using the town bid funding to, to, to create a bespoke sports and leisure hub focused on a modern pavilion providing the facilities that the community are looking for and to develop the outdoor space to give the clubs and societies that we've currently got and potentially new clubs and societies an ability to attract new clubs to the area. Tonight we're going to hear from various sports clubs, the existing clubs that we've got and new clubs that have generated interest in the town fund bidding such as acrobatics and gymnastics. So Fusion's vision is to provide facilities for the Wirral Park Bowls Club, the Glastonbury Football Club relocation to the site, the Acrobatics Club, and to develop the facilities for the Glastonbury Cricket Club, which are hugely important clubs with a long history in Glastonbury. The development of the site will also include the recreational use of the fields for the town's health and well-being, both on a physical and on a mental level. Fusion feels that the site is of incredible importance to the <laughs> on all levels, and the compromises that we'll make in the end development will satisfy everyone in Boston. <laughs> Tonight we've heard about uh, a question about whether there are young people interested in sport in this town, and we've recently seen the closure of the Glastonbury Leisure Centre facilities. So that places an even more importance on the development of the sports and leisure hub at Tour Leisure Centre. Recreational use. At the moment, there are hundreds of people using the field to uh, enjoy a picnic with the family, to throw a frisbee around, and that and those uh, activities will be protected going forward. Yes. The development of the, the development of the all weather pitch. We're working with fields in trust at the moment, but that will be less than 20% of the total land space. What about the land? I'm sorry to say. Uh, well, I, I think that. Thank you. Well, could I? Well, Jack, I, I, um, I hear the floor speaking. I'm. Uh, would remind the floor that we, as a council, we're having a presentation to understand better the town deal proposals that are being put forward from the sports um, cluster. And um, I'm sure that uh, Fusion will be able to answer any questions outside of the meeting. And you may wish to respond to something there if you wish, but not on behalf of the councillors. We're happy to hear about the town deal Clusters work. Thank you. Through the chair, please, chair. Can you ask people to go through the chair when they want to speak? Thank you. Chair, yeah. just to confirm, I'm happy to respond to any responses outside of the meeting, but the presentation is about the sports and leisure hub and the town fund bid. So thank you. I'll, I'll carry on. Yeah. So in, in terms of youth provision, the all-weather pitch will provide a year-round facility for the local primary schools to use and the local clubs to use at their will as well. We're looking at developing um, junior football, girls football, disability football. The cricket club will look to develop their junior section. 
even further than they've already started. And those facilities will be provided through the town bid funding. So that's how it will influence the, the town and the young people in this town. We've got young aspiring sports people that can't use the facilities that we've currently got because they are run down, they are not fit for purpose. We recognise that. The relocation of the Glastonbury Football Club represents that move as well. Their facilities aren't fit for purpose and won't allow them to develop where they want to go. The creation of a sports and leisure hub at Tor Leisure Centre will provide for all of those people. They'll provide for the stroke and rehabilitation groups that need to be set up in the town. They'll provide for the book clubs that need a space in the town. So there is a recreational aspect to it, as well as a sporting aspect to the bid. And that's why we're hoping to unite everyone together with a supported and well-looked-after bid. And we'll reach that point when we bring everyone together behind one map. So what I'll do now is I'll hand over to Glastonbury. I'll hand over to Glastonbury Football Club now. Thank you very much. Welcome Glastonbury Football Club. Thank you. Good evening. Um, we are an old club. We've been in the town for over 131 years. And um, as true what was just said, um, things haven't gone very well for us over the past 20 or 30 years, mainly due to the poor facilities and the condition of our football pitch. But we're more than a football club. We're a community-based organisation. Um, because of the hard work and effort, of, of club members over the over the past 10, 15 years. We've refurbished a facility down there off the pitch. We've included new changing rooms, we've put in new central heating systems, we've, we've enlarged the um, officials' dressing rooms to incorporate lady officials now as we have to. We've undertaken a number of refurbishment projects which have seen our actual off-the-field facilities improve no end. And because of this, and because of the affordable rates we charge, because we run a very good, successful business, we've become home to a number of organisations within the town who, would, who, who alternatively wouldn't have a home to go to. Namely, Hannah's Hoover's Dance class, classes, who have over 60 members, Glastonbury Town Band, who couldn't find anywhere to rehearse in Glastonbury, apart from us as a football club. They were previously rehearsing uh, down in Yeovil. Because of that, we feel we're more of a football club. Yes, we do play football. Yes, that's our mainstay. But actually, we're a focal point for the community. This has never been more evident than coming out of COVID. We've seen people come down to our football club to enjoy the facility, enjoy the, the social side of things, not just to watch the football, but because it's become important to them. And because of our place in the community, because we've been in their town for over 131 years, we see this as an opportunity now to move to a better facility. One that we can progress as a football club, but also progress our off-the-field activities as well. And that's crucial to providing homes for organisations within the town that don't have a home. If it weren't for us, they wouldn't be able to exist and survive. If we're talking about young people, this is crucially about young people. This is about the deprived youngsters of Glastonbury having sporting facilities that actually will help them to, to advance, not just in sport, but in life in general. We've seen over the past 18 months the crucial role sport and leisure plays in people's lives. This must continue. This, plant, this town can no longer become deprived of these facilities. When these facilities are on offer to every other town in Mendon, Glastonbury yet again is left behind. It can't continue. We have an opportunity here that must be seized. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that needs to be said. Sorry. Steve, uh, you have the chair. I think we got to, sorry. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having us. 
Um, we work a little bit differently than the other clubs because we're brand new, literally brand new. I know some of you councillors have already met us because we've been here before, so thanks for having us back. <laughs> um, we're Edge, so we're brand new. We started in June this year. We're an acrobatic gymnastics uh, club. Now, for those of you who don't know what that is, we did bring a few photos that you're welcome to look at, but it's balancing and throwing a partner is the only way I can describe it. <laughs> it's probably worth looking at the photos, but it combines general gymnastics with teamwork, perseverance, strength, stamina, everything that every child needs. Um, we started in June, we had 22 members, and we now have just under 100. So there is a um, real need for the sport in the area. We've really struggled with the venue, which has been our biggest downfall, because you need a ceiling to be able to throw people in the air. And no, we've struggled to find one, so the venue for us is going to be huge. Um, so we're limited to our venues, so recently we bought a van and we've been living our gymnastics equipment in the back of our van and moving it to and from various venues throughout Street and Glastonbury and we are still trying to grow. We can't do that in the facilities that we've currently got. Um, I'm going to hand you over to Lil, she's a, a European gymnast and it's, it's more her club than it's mine, it's definitely more her passion. Um, I tend to do the admin behind the scenes so I'll let her fill you in on the rest. Um, we're passionate about bringing the little known sport of acrobatics. We're passionate about bringing the little known sport of acrobatics into the spotlight and to use gymnastics as a tool to teach children important values such as hard work, commitment, perseverance, self motivation, and teamwork. If you want to train acrobatics from here, you have to travel to Yeovil or Western or to Bristol, like I had to, to achieve what I wanted to do. Um, we currently train out four different venues, as Indy said, and we cannot access a hall large enough for our needs. And the fact that we've grown from 23 members to just under 100 in, in only a couple of months, you can clearly see that there's a need in the area. We've applied for the Towns Investment Fund because we want to make acrobatics as accessible as we can and to create opportunities for as many young people and children as possible. And we think that Glastonbury will be the perfect place to create a central hub to home acrobatics in Mendip. We would also be able to provide facilities for parkour, circus, aerial, homeschool groups, disability groups, fitness classes, rehab groups, etc. Um, we also want to be able to work closely with the local community to put on competitions and displays and events which will bring people together from all over the UK to participate and celebrate sporting excellence whilst embracing all levels of ability. This will also have an impact on local businesses as we'll be bringing people in. And we'll work with the other sports on the tour site towards a common goal of keeping fit whilst having fun and creating opportunities within sport, volunteering and coaching to create a true centre of excellence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, we're a part of Paul's Club. It's over 90 years old. And currently operating out of an old school room, which is over 60 years old. Therefore, we're aiming to build a new clubhouse and changing rooms. We currently play short mat balls in the winter, but we have to hire Godley Village Hall and Morton Village Hall in able to participate. This restricts our membership. By building a new clubhouse, we can bring short mat balls in the house and we can make the facilities available to everybody all year round. The Bowls Club will not just be long bowls on a Monday evening. It will offer far more to Glastonbury and the wider community than it has historically. It will be a venue that people can come to for various reasons other than the game of long bowls, such as short map bowls, functions, and community events, to name just a few. Thank you. Well, Heather? Uh, 
Um, good evening, Your Worship, um, councillors and um, members of the public, ladies and gentlemen. Um, for those that don't know me, I know lots of people do, I'm the chair at Glastonbury Cricket Club. Um, I quite often speak at town council meetings, so most people have heard my voice before. Um, the Cricket Club, we are just very excited about the opportunity of significant capital investment at Tour Sports and Leisure. It's our home. It's the home of Glastonbury Cricket Club and has been for over 100 years. It's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity um, to invest down there. Um, I wonder if it could be unlikely that we'll get this chance to invest down there again. Our focus as the Cricket Club is um, a new pavilion um, for sports and community use. It's interesting to hear from the gymnastics club and all the, the facilities that are going to be needed. So we need to replace the tired old building that's down there. Um, and at last, this could be some serious investment down at Tor. Um, we envisage a state-of-the-art building, sustainable. Um, we're looking at maybe rainwater harvesting, solar panels, possibly heat pumps, something modern, something to be proud of in the heart of Glastonbury, right in the heart of Glastonbury. is something that um, the whole town can be excited and proud to have in their community. I, I've spoken to and I'm speaking to our governing body, so that's the ECB <clears throat> and Somerset Griffith Foundation, and I've also spoken to SASP. They are very supportive and excited about the possibility of investment in a new building down at Tor to replace that, um, that old one. Um, they're offering their guidance and knowledge, redesign and operation, um, particularly when I was talking about sustainable uh, sustainable factors. That's something they're very, very keen on and very excited to support. Um, well, I mentioned the uh, sustainable um, rainwater harvesting. We could use the water to water our square. Solar panels for power, uh, heat pumps, etc. So basically design the whole building to be a modern, sustainable, modern building. Um, something that Again, we can be proud of. Um, they see, both the ECB and Somerset Cricket Foundation see the site as a strategic centre for cricket in Somerset. It's perfectly placed between Taunton and Minehead and Bath. Basically, you've got a big hole in the centre of Somerset. And they would see that as a place for them to run courses and uh, to have women's and girls' cricket developed, disability cricket, etc. Um, so it's something that is really positive for them um, to have uh, built. This, is the, this will be Somerset Cricket Foundation, who are our governing body within Somerset. Um, finally, the last thing I wanted to say is that time is very short. Um, that there is a need for a business case to be finalised by the end of June next year. That is really, really short time frame. It's absolutely critical that things are moved on in a timely way um, if, if we are to secure this funding. Um, obviously, it has to be done properly and it has to be, um, has to be managed and consulted. It has to be done properly, basically, if we are going to get approval. Um, it's exciting times. Um, and with a, combined with our new adult section who are growing and building, and our existing youth section, this will be fantastic news for the cricket club down there. And um, we're very, very keen that the new pavilion would go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for letting us have the time to explain what we're trying to achieve down at the Tall Ledger side. I hope that's allayed some of the fears and a lot of the misrepresentation that has been. Uh, going around the town, because the truth is we're at very early stages at the moment. Nobody knows what's going down there. So any photos you see on the gates down there or any rumours you hear, people have no foundation for any of that information. There will be lots of consultation done in this process. There will be plenty of opportunity to come down to the site, to talk to the different sports, to talk to Mendip Council, who are working with very closely. Um, as Heather said, we're in the process now of getting this business plan together, which has to be done by next June. There's a lot of work to do, but we're all, as you can tell, very enthusiastic about this project. You've got some fantastic people there who live and breathe their sports and want everything, but nothing but the best for this town. 
And I think, as Heather said, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, we need to grab it with both hands and work as hard as we can to uh, get the best for not just the people in town now, but for generations to come and have something we're really proud of. So uh, thanks for the time, Chair, and uh, I'm really pleased for the guys who are coming down. So I would just like to say how exciting it is to have this cluster in, as part of the town deal. Just the sheer history of it, the hundreds of years that some of the clubs have been in existence in the town. And as someone said, this is an opportunity we will probably never see the like of it again. So it is something that we must make full use of, this opportunity for the town and for the, the sports clubs and for the recreation as well. Is that exactly the only site available for this for the Excuse me. Yes. It is a sports field. <laughs> it's, it's been it's, it's indeed by fields of trust. And it's an open natural space. No, it's not. It's a sports field. It has been for years. No, it's not. Well, uh, I think I think that um, well, I think that that is a. Yeah, I I I understand. I understand your your thought and concern, but. We're, we're not having a public meeting about the um, sports uh, cluster tonight. We're having an information session for the town council on the sports cluster. I dare say that as part of the process of getting this moving forward, there will be a public uh, event where people can come and ask the questions. But tonight is not that, uh, that time. But I do understand that all councillors have heard the concerns, some of which were raised at the public participation earlier on, heard the concerns that people have around this. But it is a good opportunity for us to hear some of the reality of it as well, because we've got a combination of uh, the great Chinese whispers of Glastonbury. Suddenly we've got Ashton Court going to be built in the middle of the town and I'm afraid that is not mm. on the cards and never has been and as Councillor Henderson says this project hasn't even got that far yet. Rob? Everywhere I'm, Lynn, everywhere, well, you, won't, you won't miss it, we'll, we'll make sure, I'll tell you personally. Yeah, that's right. Sorry, just to remind you, the people of Bastonbury chose the building trust protection for the building trust. Thank you. Thank you. So I would like to say, I'm conscious of time, but if there are any councillors with any burning questions for the sports cluster, Councillor Henderson, now is the time to ask, but I'm sure that we will all be invited to any public event that's happening as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Councillor Barnett. If I may, uh, Chair, uh, thank you very much to Steve and to the class. I mean, it sounds really exciting that there's going to be better facilities. There's somebody who, before I became dis disabled, participated in a lot of sport. But I would like a clarification, because we've heard several times this evening of the concerns of a large stadium being built and this isn't the first time that we've been hearing it ever since the town deal discussions for the sports facilities came about. That's been on the table. Am I hearing clearly that that isn't part of the plan? Well, obviously, Glastonbury Football Club hope to move onto the Tall Leisure site. There will be a pitch, there will be stands and changing rooms, not a stadium. But all these proposals that we would like to see become reality, I've got to go through the planning process, the same as anything else. So whatever is going to happen at the Tall Leisure site, we'll go to planning, we'll come to this town council planning committee and go and amend it. So everything will be scrutinised and nothing's going to be plonked in there that nobody wants, if you know what I mean. It's going to have to pass public scrutiny and adhere to all the planning laws. So 
when that event happens, then we'll all be very aware of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillors, I see no other hands raised, so I would like to thank the Sports Cluster for coming to speak to us. Well, this is for councillors, I'm afraid public participation is over, but there will be a public meeting of the form I think you were hoping for at some point. So, um, councillors, I'm just saying thank you very much to Sports Cluster for coming tonight. It's extremely useful for councillors to hear what's happening, and I look forward to seeing how this progresses, as I'm sure the rest of the council do. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, councillors, we now move on to item four, which is to approve and sign as a correct record the minutes of the town council meeting held on the 12th of October. I don't seem to have this in my papers. Thank you. Can I draw councillors' attention to page 26? Oh, I haven't found it. Page 27. Councillor Serena Rani Duke. Yeah, may I ask for a point of clarity, please? Yes. Um, section 101, uh, part of Councillor McDougall's district report. Um, you informed that there was now a need for a neighbourhood plan group and several people volunteered. And when is that neighbourhood plan group going to meet? Because it's now one month since we agreed we needed the group. And I think this is a matter of some urgency. Thank you, Councillor. I think that you're quite right to raise that point. Um, we did agree the volunteers. I'm afraid that as the um, chair of the meetings that were held previously, I have not uh, attempted to convene that meeting, but perhaps uh, this would be an opportune moment to do so. And I'm looking to the clerk. Is there a, a date which you comes to mind in relation to the next, maybe before Christmas, where we could hold such a meeting in an evening? Happy to organise the evening, but I, I don't have the diary in my, in my uh, sufficient to be able to do that this evening. But let's, uh, you and I certainly, because we're all about the chair, we were the next one, um, chair, and uh, we'll convene the meeting as soon as. Part of the reason, of course, for Texas is that I have been absent for two weeks through ill health. So uh, that's part of the backlog that we've done away. Well, thank you, and I'm very pleased to see you here tonight, Jared, after being unwell for that time. So, councillors, I am going. I'm minded to convene a meeting with correct notice uh, sometime in early December for the neighbourhood plan. And thank you, councillor, for raising it. Um, we now move on to uh, the rest of page 27. Page 28. Page 29. So, Councillor Coles? Um, yes, um, <coughs> item 111, um, a site visit between the clerk and Councillor Latham to ident identify the solution gates on the footpath off the Glastonbury bypass. Um, have we got an update on that, um, Joe, about the 106 money? The um, cause is correct. He did observe both cancellation and myself uh, and looking at the site. And the item is on the agenda of the next property and assets committee meeting, which is scheduled for a week tomorrow, the 16th of November. We'll be discussed then. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Rowan Dougal? Yes, um, just the uh, um, 106D, which is on page 29 the climate emergency report. It mentions the evening of presentations on the 3rd of November to coincide with COP26. There was also the open day, which happened today, November the 9th, which was reported on. So I think that those should be in the minutes as well. Thank you very much. Then You're quite right, they're not in the minutes. Uh, Gerard, would you be happy to, to add today's meeting to that minute? Thank you. So page 30.
Do you, I have your agreement that this is a true record of the meeting? I will suffice. Aye. Aye. Thank you. As I sign that, we move on to actions from the previous meeting. These will be tabled. I'm asked the town clerk to speak to this, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Just run through them very quickly. I've already mentioned the gates uh, and the next meeting of the podcast assets on the 16th of November. Um, in amongst the meeting minutes, you mentioned, you'll see mention of tour leisure and sports groups. They have, as we heard, presented this evening. Um, signage at the bottom of town to celebrate the balloon success has been ordered. That's on the three uh, points coming into town from the main road directions. Um, all the staff directly involved in delivering bloom and the success of bloom have been given to by the mayor. The um, list of project leads for the town deal project has been distributed to all councillors. The responsible financial officer was written to and thanked for the accompanying statements for the budget, which you have applauded <coughs> and uh, congratulated on the, uh, the easiness of reading those and comparing. The, Sole electrical have been informed that one of the charging points is not working. That needs chasing up because uh, I, I have not yet heard back from them. The town deal fund communications team are aware of the bloom success and the purchase of the hanging baskets, which was part of the accelerator program, and that of course made a link to the success of, of uh, bloom. And finally, the frost fair display in St. Dunstan's Garden. Uh, the town deal have been approached. <coughs> Um, but it is unlikely that we will be having a display of frost uh, uh, of town fuel projects on the day of frost fair, mainly due to an absence of sufficient staff to man the uh, the, the, the uh, location. Thank you, Worship. Thank you very much. Uh, we now move to receive a police report. There isn't one tabled, but. Am I correct in thinking that there may have been a report sent to us electronically um, a few couple of weeks ago that, that may have been intended for this evening's meeting? Do other councillors remember no. this? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, councillors, I think that um, we will have to resort to looking to our emails if we don't have anything that we remember from that report. Um, but it, it was sent to us and. Um, I'm sure that it's because Jared's been off with ill health over the, that period of time that perhaps he hasn't got round to opening that one of his many emails I'm sure he came, came back to work to. Okay, Your Worship, if I may, I haven't followed up with the police, um, both at Sergeant Lancy and of the two beat managers, but there's three beat managers, Tom Miller's back, but he's only back for a short term. Um, I haven't had a response. I can only believe that either yesterday and today they've been on, on days away from, from the beat. But the important thing I want to stand and share this with you is that Sergeant Lancy will be coming to your December meeting of the full council to make a presentation uh, to you all, uh, to us all, and his title of that will be Regulations and Procedures when Addressing Antisocial Behaviour. This is something you've been asking for for a while, and that <coughs> will be happening on the, uh, the, the first, second Tuesday in December. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Your Worship, you're right about the email and the report, but it was a more general report. It was actually a report for the whole area rather than Glastonbury, and it was rather vague in terms of general platitudes about what's going on in the area. I think we'd be much better served if we had a proper police report, as we usually have at the meetings, which give us more detail about what is going on in the town the area. So I think we should ask for them to reinstate that report so that we can have more information when and if particularly on the sergeant at the public Thank you. As, as I'm minded to that as well, with, with uh, the, t the beat team manager coming to the meeting next time is the perfect time to request that, and minutes the request of that. Councillors, um, we now are here to receive and consider the resolutions of the meetings that have happened since the last council meeting. We have the Resolutions from the planning meeting of the 19th of October. There before you, they've been tabled. Uh, unless anyone has a burning requ requirement to speak to these, I would just like just to note them, if that's all right. Aye. Noted. Aye. Thank you. So now we are here to receive county council reports. Councillor Napper, would you like to go first? 
Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, very little to report on, right? Uh, Unitary is um, uh, seems to be stuck in, uh, in doldrums at the moment. Although we were told that we were going to hire, hear something uh, um, quite spectacular by the beginning of November, it's now sort of two weeks in, and um, nothing spectacular has happened. So uh, I, I, I can't really report. I, I don't know whether my colleague can. Um, on, on, on it. It's very frustrating. Um, we, we don't even know the boundaries. Uh, whatever, so um, I, I, I can't comment on it, and I'm sure uh, my colleague can't comment on it. But there is one thing which I can comment on, um, and um, it, it concerns my, my colleague Liz as well as myself. Um, there is a problem with water uh, down in Acre, um past uh, Tor Trucks, past Barry Britain's place, whereby there is water coming from uh, an inspection uh, cap from uh, open reach. Um, and we've been trying for the last, um, oh, well, Liz and I have been trying for the last, I don't know, months to try and get something done about it uh, because it's affecting people on that road. Yeah. Uh, and I'm afraid um, at this moment we've, we've got absolutely bloody nowhere. Uh, but I would like to make it known. Uh, on, on the minutes of the council, that Liz and I are trying to get something done on that. Uh, but it seems to me that the last, and what we're told, is that the last um, uh, possibly 20 years, this has been tossed around, and, and when we get a lot of rainfall, um, water eludes from the uh, from the Oldham Reach um, uh, inspection cover. Uh, they say it's not their problem. Uh, and uh, I think that Bristol Water has now possibly been brought into the mix. I'm sure they have tossed it back as well. Um, so where we're going, I don't know. At the end of the day, um, if we have a, 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 an amount of uh, rainfall, uh, there is water covering the road. If water covers the road and we get a freezing yeah. session, then we've got a real bad, bad time down there. Not only that, some of the residents are... Are, are, are having a, a hard time, uh, and my heart goes out to them, which which I'm sure it is, would, would, would uh, agree with me that something has to be done, uh, whether it's Somerset County Council, whether it's Open Reach, whether it's uh, Bristol Water, I don't know, uh, but hopefully um, we can get something done in the very, very, very near future. Thank you. Thank you. Council, would, it, would there, there be any merit in this council writing a letter of support to, for your um, inquiries, as it were, to, to um, support yes. you in this? Yes. Can any, anything to try and get something, something done now. Councillor, it's been going on too long. Are we are we happy to write a letter of support for the efforts of the county council? We're definitely on that one. I will suffice. So, Terry, are you happy to take questions? Yes. Yep. Um, Councillor Tucker, and then... We have nothing to report. Uh, Councillor Cottle, then Councillor Tucker. Uh, uh, sorry, Terry, I'm not going to be bothering you too much, but something that Liz already knows about from previous meetings. Uh, there are two things that bug me about our present county councillor, more than most. County council, not councillors, uh, more than most. And one of them is their failure to take care of the small things in life such as replacing signs and straightening signs. Uh, there's been one at Heart Lake, Heart Lake Bridge. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, it's been down for at least three and a half years on a lopsided angle like this. Now, surely county council staff must drive by there at some stage. <coughs> so, that way or this way? It's a Heart Lake Bridge. Oh, yeah. 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 Coming you, you in. can't miss it. It's been like that for friends. Coming There's in. There's been signs missing from the end of Wick Lane for at least three years. Uh, the one that goes that said Glastonbury that way and Shepton Mallet that way, that's gone and it hasn't never been replaced. And I've noticed in other areas within Mendip, within our own little tight bit, other ones that are falling apart and not replaced if they fall over or things like this. So that's just a little thing, one of the little things. And then another one is slightly bigger, which really, really gets up my nose. And it's quite good to see that um, a particular uh, homeowner is in here this evening to see me say something about it again. The footpath that goes between Windmill Hill Road and Rowley Road. Yeah. 
It has been closed forever, seven years at least, okay? It, this should not be beyond the wit of a county council to sort this, even as they have to deal with a, an obstinate person in a house that needs to be done. They can do the work and say, you pay us, you know? This path, footpath should be open. It's a disgrace. And it is an inconvenience to other people in, in the area who live alongside. So if you could <coughs> bang on about that to dear Mr. Fothergill, that would be very good. I saw the email come through um, this week, last week. And I thought, oh dear, it's raised its head again. And uh, I guess we'll be hearing about it. Um, but I, I think there's been a lot of work done by a neighbour. Uh, and and nothing, is, nothing is happening there. But yes, I... I yeah. I'll, I'll, it's really somebody's oh, trying to with yourself and the age of me will relate to some of the people who live in the area as well uh, because it is a really serious situation it's been going on for far too long where the children would go that you would would used to use that to go to school right. and all these sort of things and just to be ignored but well, okay liz even came and took pictures of it and sent them in and uh, at best I remember. And this has been going on for like say six, seven years. Seven years, seven years minimum, longer than that, sir. But I'm not going at you about that. I'm just that's generally. If they, can, if, no, if they can't look after the small things, yeah. If they can't look after the small things, they cannot look after the big things. So that's my attitude. So, so you're on about like finger posts, really? Is, is all sorts. You look at all the stuff. You just look at the signs when you're driving around. Look at them. Okay. Cheers. Thank you, Councillor Tucker, then Councillor Henderson. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Richard. So I'll, I'm going to follow the same thing, I'm afraid. Uh, first of all, I'll definitely support Nick because I reckon it's 10 years that footpath. That yeah, it is. Yeah. It's really annoying and there's absolutely no excuse for it. Yeah. And the other thing that is annoying is that Basketfield Lane drains continually block up. And they were, they've been flooding, and Saturday morning we had the first frost, and I was not prepared for the fact that I'd yeah. get in right into that junction. For a <laughs> <laughs> that whole of that piece of road was, was a sheet of ice. Yeah. So that is an accident waiting to happen. And they've let that water come out. They, they should surely maintain these on a regular basis. They know where the problems are going to be. And I, I would suggest to you that that's where the, it's not coming from <coughs> op, open reach, don't put water down there, conduits, and Bristol water, don't put water down open reaches, conduits. It is stormwater that is getting into the conduit. It's just the, the fact that open reach, you've got a conduit running down through that, that part of the world. If they were to solve the problem of getting the water into the proper drains, then it wouldn't be reaching the conduit and, and filling and flooding out through equity. So they need to start up in the tour, getting the water back into the proper drains, and then you find that perhaps the problem is solved. But Basketfield Lane is, is, is dangerous again because of the fact that the, and there was a guy there looking to do some pothole repairs and I pointed him <coughs> out here and he said, well, yes, I'll report it, but nothing's happened. I thought that, um, a little while ago we have problems with the um, with the reservoir up in up in the tor, and I think that, that has been fixed. It has, um, and and I thought that, that all our troubles had gone away, yeah. but they certainly haven't, you know, and, and it's still the same sort of problem. Uh, but it's now on the main uh, on, on the main drag, uh, which we you know we've got to do something about it, or else you know th th there could be a real bad emergency on that. And uh, like I say, my colleague uh, Liz and myself, we are battling against it, but um, uh, it's against the tide at the moment. But you know, uh, literally, I keep going. <clears throat> I'm certainly not going to go down there and do it, and nor is Liz going to go down there and do it. Uh, it's it's got to be some guy with a with a uh, yes. knows what he's doing. Yeah. Um, but you know, um, we've got to get the guys down there to uh, we need put the pressure on. <clears throat> but but um, um, to, to do that it is um, perhaps something from, from town council will aid us, that's all I can say. Councillors, are you happy for us to add that to our let increasing letters to county council? So, I, yes. so sorry, we should say, so can we run to high makes yeah. and express our concern with the, the water that, that is, it starts in Basketfield Lane, Makes its way down through the to the main road, yeah. and then it finishes up down in Acre. Yeah. yeah. 
I think the word you need to add to the end of there is again. <laughs> yes. So, Councillor Henderson and then Councillor... Well, well, my initial question is, is kind of null and void now, but I was just going to say, well, in that case, chasing Bristol Water isn't going to do a lot of good then, is it? No, it's actually it's an in-house problem, it's isn't it? Not. We need to get the... the um, <coughs> From the council, that would yeah. solve the problem. Yes, yeah. it seems like. Yeah, so don't worry about Christmas Walk. I was just going to say that they, they promised to clean their problems within 10 days of it being reported. So, but, but which 10 days? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 10 days. So I think it's the, it's the gully meeting. Days or years? Days. But anyway, I don't think Christmas Walk is the way forward anyway. I'll try and remind them of that, Steve. Councillor McDougall. Well, there's water pouring down the high street today. Uh, it came from I reported it to Les and he said that it had been reported already. Uh, I can say that I do know if the report to Crystal Waldry yesterday by some friends of mine, uh, an engineer looked at it and said he would get a team there first thing this morning. It was still mm. running. Thank you. From the floor. Councillor Keary. <coughs> I can't resist adding to the comments about the footpath between Rowley Road and Windmill Hill because if anything indicates a stitch in time saving nine, then that is. There are now young trees growing up in the middle of the path mm -hmm. and what should have been sorted out with the resident quite quickly, I would have thought, by if necessary taking strong action because I know it's been going on for years, they now not only have, can open the path, they have to completely relay the whole path from top to bottom. So if they got on with the work more promptly, this would have saved money all around. So I just and the other point I would say, if they're take if they're dealing with signs, they leave behind the big posts that they had signs on coming into the town. You can see them just at the corner of the Mill Stream or they're great big grey posts rusting that should have been taken down when the signs were taken down and um, are now being used by all sorts of organisations, but they should have been taken down at the area and tightened up. Thank you. Any other councillors wish to ask a question of Councillor Napper? Thank you, Councillor Napper. Now I move <coughs> on to <coughs> Councillor Leish. Uh, thank you, Russia. <coughs> uh, the really red situation is it's really complex because it's actually down to the householder, not the county council. It's been through building control, it's with legal, it's all over the place. And, uh, and it is a real shame when a local authority gets the blame for something that actually lies with a homeowner. So if you have a hedge onto the pavement and it overgrows, it's your responsibility as a householder. <laughs> if, you, if you have uh, a wall built on the edge of your garden and you've infilled the garden to make a nice wall to the top of the wall, but you put too much weight on it and the wall gives way, it's your responsibility to put it right. So if we could persuade the county to sort that out, and we would if we could, because we've been trying for years, the taxpayer would have to pay for it and then try to claim the money back from the householder, who I don't think even lives in that house. So it is a very complex situation. Uh, Terry and I have been copied into emails almost every month for the last, I'd say, at least three years, and it's been going on before then. So it's the point at which a local authority takes responsibility, spends public money on private property, and then has to try and claim the money back. So it's a really complex one, that one. Um, we've gone through all the old photographs of when the house was first built. We've tried everything we can to put pressure on. The other resident has been incredibly helpful with, with recollection and with pressure, and it's still failing. But it's absolutely correct that, that the footpath is now almost obliterated by growth so and you can't get in it to clear anything away because it's all fenced off for safety reasons because of, of the wall falling down and bringing tons of earth with it from the garden 
So there's, there's that one. There's also on, on water, I'm actually convinced that there is something wrong somewhere around Ashwell Lane because I've now twice been out in the pouring rain looking at where the water is running in that area. And alongside the disused reservoir, there's a small patch of land by where Bristol Water's equipment is and their aerial for where it's called their tele telemetry or something, is it? Yeah. About how they monitor the water levels in the reservoir. And I'm absolutely convinced where water used to go into that reservoir, it now diverts. So where it's coming down off the slopes of the tour, next to the disused reservoir where there are some steps up to the Bristol Water brick, red brick building, it comes out of the ground as a fountain this high and it then runs down the road. It then disappears into the gullies. It comes out again in Millfield Junior School's land on the tour side and it runs out of their manhole cover, it comes out of there like a fountain. It then floods all of Wick Lane, and we managed to get the drains cleared under Wick Lane to eventually take that away down the moor. And then further down, opposite the entrance to Eggerley School, Millfield Junior School, it comes out again, out of the gullies where it should be going in. And it runs all the way down, and it runs down inside the BT ducting as well. It then comes out of, it bubbles out of the BT chamber, and the water is still on the road days after it's dried up everywhere else. And it is sitting in the garden of that house there and wrecking the wall. It's also running down into Cinnamon Lane, where there's a house that has now got its outside wall ruined by standing water. And they're now having to pay themselves to get a drainage channel put in the road. They have to get a license from county to work on the road. Finally got the county to produce that license without charging the householder. But she is having to pay for that drain to be put in and get the water so that it again goes down the moor. It is extraordinary the amounts of water. On, and there are other parts of the world that have got no water at all. It's you know, crazy that we can't somehow harness those waters, those flooding waters, and use them more effectively. So the only thing I, I was intending to update you on was a meeting yesterday with uh, some members of the multi-agency group, so Michelle Cusack and Tom Rutland, householders, farmers uh, from Stone Down Lane area. So we had a long and not easy meeting about the issue of getting on with narrowing the road. So we ended up with five points to chase up on that. One is obviously doing the work to narrow the road according to the plans that this council has already seen, but also taking into account um, the corner by the Barrington, the, the little road that runs to the Barringtons, where that is seen as being another vulnerable space. We're trying to get the parking restrictions remarked in Wellhouse Lane, which have been on the schedule for work for over a year now and are still not done. We're trying to get the National Trust to change the um, postcode. Or Google, they've changed everything on their own website. They've done everything that they were asked to do. Uh, but Google still gives the postcode for the tour as a private cul de sac of Ashwell Lane. And so anybody putting that into their sat nav gets directed to a tiny cul de sac, which is not even an adopted road mm. of Ashwell Lane. And not surprisingly, residents are deeply unhappy. And we also need to check with the police and with NSL enforcement what is really possible when we get disabled parking bays put back in in Stone Down Lane as part of this whole project. And also because there will be gateways left uh, as parking places and for access for farmers into the field. So we're looking at maybe can we reduce any of the gateways where fields lead into other fields because there's real concern that once NSL stop working each day at six o'clock, it will just become yet again a, a parking lot as much as it can be. So those sorts of things 
we're on to all of the time um, and there are there are gullies blocked all over the town i went on the true speed walk <laughs> gullies in mount house road i doubt they've been cleared in 10 years they they're growing weeds and there is there is supposed to be a schedule of clearing gullies it's only supposed to happen once every something like four years more often in vulnerable places but i would say when it rains i should think no water in manor house road goes anywhere it must just all flood to the bottom so what i do is i take photos every time i can i i send them off i try to take photos of all of the gullies not just one or they'll come out and clear one and leave the others so it is almost a full-time job reporting on the highways of glastonbury i'm afraid doesn't mean we give up, but I wish we had more success to report on. Thank you. Any? Are you happy to receive questions? Of course. Councillor Tucker. <coughs> can, can I first of all ask what the time scale is on the works around the tour? Because there was muted that it will be done for Midsummer's Day, and I'm now getting constantly barraged that it's not going to be done for midwinter if we don't get on with it very soon it has now got to the stage where on a sunday it is virtually impossible to get you can't get through with a horse box or or any farm implements because it is so far it is chocker uh, well we've asked for it to be done before the winter solstice yeah, but we asked for it to be done before the summer solstice. But what I'm asking is when it is likely to be done, because I'm getting constantly barraged by local people who think that it was all agreed and that it's wonderful mag group, we're going to sort it all out. And, and it's a bit like the climate change. It seems to be all blah, 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 and no actual action. And, that, and what we want up there is some action, because I don't drive through there now without two or three rats coming across the road it is awful up there i mean there is so much human excrement up there that it is feeding fat rats that you wouldn't believe this is supposed to be one of the most iconic sites in the country and we've allowed it to degenerate to this there's the action of taking away the W lines, then the action of no action on the on the signs. The signs, I don't know how many times we change them. I see they're all painted over again. This is just a total waste of time until we actually put what we said in the beginning, which is the, the means that people physically can't park there, and that's what we're going to have to do. So my question is, actually, when is it going to happen, rather than when we hope it? Do we know? Have we been given a time by county as to when it is going to happen? I haven't been given a time by county, I'm afraid. I, I sat in on the meeting yesterday, I joined it late. At the end, I summed up with all of the things that I've just read out to you that we wish to see done for Stone Down Lane. Um, and I put them in writing today to the senior officer and Tom Rutland, and uh, I'm hoping to hear back from them. I, I don't know how highways was 10 years ago or 20 years ago because I wasn't a councillor then. I know that every time the county council budget is under pressure for its statutory services for adult and children's social care, that the savings come out of what they call economic and community infrastructure, which is where highways sits. So although they still spend over 80 million a year on highways, it's not the capital new works, that's just the maintenance works. It's still where the cuts get made. And I think it shows. I think it really shows. So, you wish it could I ask, would it, would it help the county councillors if this town council wrote it again to county and, and asked when this promised works could take place? Because it is causing a major problem. I, I would welcome any help. The officer uh, who leads on the MAG group is Michelle Cusack. Uh, Gerard will obviously yes. have her email address. I th I, every bit of pressure helps. The, the residents and the farmers are deeply frustrated. Yes. Residents in Bretonneau Road and the Redlands Estate are deeply frustrated. Everybody is upset about the kind of cyclical nature of enforcement that's happening at the moment with nothing having been planned 
in the meantime. It is, it is a deeply unsatisfactory situation. And at the same time, we're talking about projects totaling 23.6 million. And there are times when I drive around and I just think, this is really going to take some achieving as things stand at the moment. Well, I, I'm happy for um, to take on Councillor Tucker's um, request to write another letter to highways. Uh, Councillor Zhu and I will suffice if you're happy for us to do that. Right. And I'm remaining on my feet, chairing slow monitoring, but we might also like to catch you and suggest that we put the footpath correct that has been <laughs> so long abandoned and put a lead, get them to put a legal charge on the property. So even if they can't collect the money directly, there is a legal charge on the property so that when it changes hands, the county get their money back. But we can't allow a public footpath to be just ignored and, and, and allowed to be blocked so that youngsters can't get up and down to school, people can't use. I mean, that, that is, is a ridiculous situation if we've got to an impasse like that. The county have got the authority to be able to go on and put it right. If I blocked a public footpath, they'd be on me like a ton of bricks to, to get it shifted. So I don't see why we shouldn't, if the, even if they're absent owners of the property, why we couldn't get the work done by the county council put a bill in, but if they don't pay it, we put a legal charge on, and that way, eventually, the, the, they will recoup. And then the last thing to say is that the, the drains that you're talking about are all linked, because obviously in the days when it was the Borough Council, every, every spring and drain ran into that reservoir from that side of the tour. The, the, the pipe then ran from that reservoir down Edgarty Road and finished up in 10-foot ream, that, that is sort of in behind the cottages that have got the problem. So there is a county drain, which Stan King would have known exactly where it ran and, and where, but it is, it is a pipe. There is, there is pipes that run all down through there, which should take that water. If these, all these drains were probably cleaned out, I suspect you'd find if they were properly rotted all the way down through, the whole system would work and we wouldn't have the problem. Totally agree. Did you so the, 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 yeah, the ditch at the bottom, the ten foot reel still runs. But yeah. water runs down the road to run into it instead of down the down the pipes. So, councillors, are we happy to write that additional uh, letter as well around the the footpath that's been closed for ten years? Uh, okay, thank you. Your worship, I can advise that's Peter Hobley who has responsibility for rights away. I should also advise you there's an over 30 year waiting list to resolve rights of way in Somerset. Sure, but. Um, but do it. Perhaps no, Councillor Tucker could stand in one of them and we can tell them where they could get the ton of bricks because it's on the wall that's fallen down. <laughs> so, um, well. At a point of information, all of these reports give us every confidence that up, we're moving to a unity authority run by. <laughs> yes. Can I just add three points that, I, that I'm aware of that have been raised in both councillors' reports? This might, as an update on three things that I made. One is, Councillor Lapper made reference to the structural change order. In your papers, I have given you a copy of the structural change order correspondence that I've received. Um, but if you read it through, we're still awaiting by the end of the month whether or not there will be elections in May 2022 or May 2023. That's the first point to raise. The second is, um, way back when I first joined this council, uh, I corresponded with the county council. The portfolio holder for the time I'm talking about referenced the footpath from Windmill Hill to Rowley Road, and the portfolio holder at the time was one David Fothergill. So he, he is very familiar with the, the situation on, on there, but it's not the correspondence that effect. And the third thing to mention is that I've opened up an email late this afternoon um, from the MAG group asking for the source of where those stones came from, Councillor Tucker, that we put in paradise. And they're asking where they came from, what they cost, they want to so they're, that what they're aware of. They don't want to put a, a bun in and then people will be able to drive up on the bun. They want to stop them doing that. And they're asking me that information. So they're just sharing with you a little snippet that I know. Thank you. you. Councillor Smythe. I have a question for um, <coughs> cancellation. <coughs> Any news on the 20 mile an hour limit on Old Wells Road? Um, 
possibility of extending the, the town in 21 now. Your Worship, I just suggest that I'm not in the business of miracles. <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite happy to put that. We really, really struggled to get the 20 mile an hour zone extended to join up with Coursing Batch and join up with St Dunstan's yes. School. To change well, that area would take a new traffic regulation order and whilst I might agree with you, I think we're better to approach that with regard to the new development at the bottom of Old Wells Road and see if we can work from that point. It, the, it, is, it is deeply frustrating to be in the situation I'm in constantly about Magdalen Street where Councillor Coles and residents and businesses report about the condition of Magdalen Street. I send photos, I email endlessly, I don't even get a response. If you don't get a response with a job number, you know that that one's going to fall out the bottom and you just have to keep going until you get a job number. And once you get the job number, then you have to keep chasing on that. But it, you know, it wastes a lot of time. And I'm sure back in the days of, of um, the town clerk having control over all of this, I'm sure it was very considerably easier, not least because people had local knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, is, is missing to a, a considerable degree. Thank you, Lisa. Before we move on to the next question, which will be Councillor Cottle, I, we have received from one of the YouTube viewers of this meeting the request for councillors to speak clearly and make sure that their mics are pointing towards them, and particularly Councillor Yes, Lindsay McDougall, um, no one could hear what you were saying. And I yeah. now see the reason is because your microphone was pointing. Has to someone else. Yeah. yeah. So, um, Councillor, do speak clearly. Councillor Smythe, someone mentioned they couldn't hear what you were saying earlier as well. Okay. So, well, Councillor Cottle. Thank you, Your Worship. I think people can usually hear me quite okay. Um, yeah, I was actually going to bring this up in the District Councillor's report, but Mike has already mentioned it here. Uh, about the Old Wells Road, and not just the speeding, uh, is also there has been a request for, from residents about double yellow lines because of what's going to happen when the new um, the new estate is completed, and there won't be enough car parking spaces, and they'll all be down the side of the road, as we know. What will happen? So I was going to suggest that we should put this as an agenda item. Or myself, and I know that Councillor Tucker has offered to back me in the past if I was to put this to a motion to the council at the next meeting. But it might be better if it was an agenda item so that we could discuss any other areas of the town that need looking at, because I'm sure that Oak Wells Road is not the only one. And then we can give you lots, Liz, to go away and uh, <laughs> argue with uh, the county about. And Terry, of course. We won't leave you out of the uh, equation there, Terry. But I think so. If we could have that put onto the next agenda, that would be good. Otherwise, uh, I'll yeah, work a exactly. motion. So, um, Councillor Cottle, I think that if you look at your minutes of the last meeting, I think you were not here at that meeting. I wasn't here. I was it, it was an agenda item um, on, our, on our last... I'm just conscious. Did we pass any motion in relation to to that item? I think we should. I seriously think we should revisit this. If you if if you ever cross the brew, have a look at the big dip as you go into street. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Napper and I have been on to that for years. We consider it a real hazard and we are constantly told that it does not present a hazard to either road users, pedestrians, cyclists. And it is ridiculous. It is far worse. I promise you, than anything in Glastonbury, and we can't even get that done. <coughs> Photos of rubber ducks in the water, and it's made no difference. And they're now promising it this side of Christmas, but I'm not. We, we thought that was Street's tourist attraction. Uh, yeah, <laughs> well, it's taken over from Greenbank Pool at the minute. Yeah. <laughs> it was a point order. 
it would not be common practice to bring something back to, to discuss within six months that had previously been discussed. My guidance on this is there was no motion or uh, decision taken on that item on the Old Welsh Road last meeting. If it is the wish of the council to bring it forward again, it, it could be permissible. Well, I'm happy if we have to suspend standing orders to put it on as a motion. So, uh, not as a motion, as an agenda item. So. Um, I would say to the clerk, please do add it to the agenda. And if you find that we need to suspend standing orders to do so, then we will. Your Worship, I thought of one other thing I should mention, which is the residence parking scheme that has been proposed for part of Wells Road for some time. That, um, that hasn't happened. The traffic regulation order has timed out. But there is still a request from residents, so it may well be that another TRO will be advertised. And the work that was done, the majority that was established, and whatever legalese has to be written still stands. So we may see that advertised again soon. Well, I have to declare an interest in that. Uh, Councillor Roney Dougal, then Councillor Henderson. Yeah, I was just thinking that the Old Wells Road item could actually be, be part of a Greater Windmill Hill item because about 20 years ago, somebody was killed in Whiting Road. And at the time, the Windmill Hill Resident Association did apply and ask for a 20 mile hour limit for the Windmill Hill residential area. Um, and of course, Old Wells Road joins on with that. And at the time, we were told, no way, we couldn't have it, even though it's just a residential area and how cars should be going nice and slow because children do play in the street in a residential area. So maybe we could have it as a, as a whole larger thing um, or part of. I think that you suggested that we could look at other items. Yeah, that, yeah so did, we, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll include that into that agenda item mm -hmm. for the next meeting. Um, Councillor Henderson. Thank you, Worship. Um, Yes, I uh, just wondering about that Wells Road um, residence parking thing. I mean, I, I was pretty sure that everybody was in favour of that. And why, why did that not go through then? Um, because... Somerset County Council. It was all approved. It was um, Simply because it was on a list of work to be contracted out. Oh, I see. So it was... It didn't get uh, done in time. Well, there was a lot of work not done over the okay. COVID period, but... You know, I'm a bit bored with that excuse. Yeah. So, we're just waiting, but I believe it is just a TRO to be published. Okay. But there will be people who object to that, of course, um, who are not residents. There was an absolute majority of residents. That's what I thought, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. We now move on to receive district council reports. I um, have very little to report myself as a district councillor. I tried to attend standards committee meeting and found that it had been postponed. I tried to attend the audit committee meeting only to find it had been postponed. But I am happy to say that the uh, Axe and Brew Drainage Board meeting that I attended via Zoom had not been postponed. So that's the only thing I can report back to you. Um, Glastonbury was discussed and um, in, in Axton Brew Drainage, as indeed you know, most of the areas are. But um, there is nothing really to report, although I am interested to hear about the issues with the water that, that we heard about today. So that's my report. I'm sorry that I haven't done a written report, but there really is not very much to yeah. say. So, uh, Councillor Cottle. Yeah, I haven't, uh, I haven't got hardly anything to say this, this time around, really, because... Uh, postponed <laughs> and, uh, and sort of cancelled and one meeting I exchanged uh, a seat for somebody else. I've had quite a lot of casework but that's different, that's not really stuff you can discuss in open council. Uh, so yeah that's, that's been as busy as ever, that sort of thing. Uh, there was one thing though, we did have one meeting this evening, I don't think you were able to attend John. I think Lindsay was there. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if Steve was there. Not this evening. You weren't there this evening? No, we're here. No, there was one at five o'clock. Oh, no. oh I, I'm afraid that I was, I was on my way home from work. Okay, I thought you probably were. I didn't give you your excuses. Right, what it was, it was an update on uh, what we've got here, really, uh, about the unitary. And uh, 
I think the two biggest things that came out there that struck me at this moment in time, until as Gerard has already pointed out, we, we, we don't know the date of our elections yet, but it is obvious that the town, parish, and the unitary election will be at the same time. Okay, that's, that's a, a given. But they also, the thing that they've mentioned, 110 councillors instead of the 85. Oh, right. Um, on a, on a, that's been mentioned, but that is a possibility, uh, maybe not permanently. Uh, so that, that was a, a positive. But the other, the other thing that I'm not quite so happy about, and I'm still unsure about, and I didn't get a full answer on it because I don't think they knew the answer, and no disrespect to Liz or to Terry, uh, I'm still a bit unsure that we will get some um, independence for Glastonbury again. I think that that may hold still that we will be four councillors for the two areas. So we'll have to wait and see. That hasn't been confirmed, and that's just an assumption. But uh, it doesn't look good at the moment for us being back to independence. But we will see. But that's no disrespect to either of you two. Well, I'm taking it as such. I'm taking it as such. Never, never mind. Take it back to Fothergill. Thank you. <laughs> um, which council would like to go next? Um, well, I actually did email a very, very short report, and then it basically just concerned my two visits, uh, two trips around the uh, Glastonbury area with uh, Ian Glover of Enforcement to do the counting of uh, caravans, lorries, etc., etc. So um, that's pretty much all I had to report. Um, did, it, did it not get sent out, Jeremy? Yes, it did. Well, oh, yeah. that's fine. Good. Yes, thank you very much for doing that. Uh, Councillor McDougall. Oh, sorry. Well, we'll, we'll ask questions in a moment. Yeah, we'll ask them that. So I've sent in a written uh, thank report. You. I did want to add that um, I'm, uh, I've put myself forward to be a rep for Somerset Bus Partnership, so I'm joining the Zoom meetings and trying to feed into that. And I would remind people that if they've got any comments about bus services and, and complaints and, and comments, then there is a, 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 a consultation at the moment. And there's a lot of money to be had. Uh, the central government is keen on buses, as we all know. Good. So um, go for it if you want some changes to be made. Thank you, Councillor. Any questions? So, question for the councillors. Can I ask what the link is for that? So, it's Somerset County Council Bus Service Improvement Plan. If you want to look that up, I haven't got the actual link here. But if you look that up, you'll find it. Thank you. Councillor Cottle. Yeah, thank you. Steve, it's a question for you, really, on the fact that you went round with Ian, I think, that's what you said. Okay. Uh, two, two questions. Did you count the caravans in four ways and three ways? No. Nope. Right. So there's another 40, probably another 50 there. Okay. They're living homes, basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, that sort of thing. And also, I, could, I didn't see them on the report, that's why I asked. And then the other one, which is probably more contentious, you couldn't count the vans, because they're not caravans, are they? If you know what I mean, the, the motorised living homes. Yeah. You couldn't count those, could you? Well, it, to be fair, you just break it down into sort of several different... Um, yeah. there's, there's caravans, vans, lorries, yeah. etc. So, so, no, quite right to what I see when I'm out of the room, that's all. I, mean, I think he's doing it on a monthly basis. Yeah. And, uh, Thank you, we're slightly was, uh, reduced from the last time he went round. Yeah. You know. well, I just, I'm, just, I'm just saying, it's just a comment. I just I just noticed it. When I, it was when I was in Brentno Road the other day. I noticed that there was absolutely stacks of them. Well, to be honest, we went down Brentley Road, I think it was about five. Yeah, right. It was so, I mean, yeah. you could go down the next day, the numbers would be... The next day, the numbers would be out. It's a snapshot of where every go. Yeah, so, right. Yeah. That's OK. And one thing I would just like to pick up on, I noticed on one of the planning board, um, planning committee minutes, there was a, a question about the application on Diana's Lane, John Keery, about yeah. the... Yes. Retrospective application. Well, we called in to see those people there, and... They have got, they have obviously got retrospective plan application in. They have got um, traveller status, and they were in charge. They were in touch with the um, gypsy and traveller of officer in Mendip, and it looked like that application will be approved. 
just if I may go on, if, if, um, if they have traveler uh, status, then they've been running a business from there for the last six, eight months. So I'm not sure they class as travelers if they're actually in situ <coughs> and running a business from presumably a registered site where they run a business. So I question their um, Councillor Keir, I must caution you that to be a traveller is an ethnic minority, not a state of uh, whether you're moving around or not. So I think that what Councillor Henderson is alluding to is the ethnicity of the people who are making application. Exactly right. Thank you. Councillor Smythe, then Councillor Adam. Yeah, I'd just like to, to draw to the attention of Councillor Henderson and others in this room with concerns about the um, overpopulation of um, caravans in, in this town and in the environs. But there was an advert in the Central Sunset Gazette last Thursday advertising for caravans to be purchased of any, any, in any condition whatsoever, mm. anything considered. And there's a phone number there if anyone would like to ring it in order to purchase a caravan in any condition whatsoever. So I'm just spotting mine. That, that average in the paper every week. Yeah. Thank Just you. as a point of information again, Your Worship, the COVID uh, situation seems to have put a complete pressure on caravans, people wanting to stay at holiday at home. I think in the caravan magazines, for example, there are multiple agencies saying they will buy any caravan, any condition, because the demand for caravans and mobile homes through COVID has been so huge, so it's probably not that extraordinary. It may be that it happens to be a blast to but I don't think it's that extraordinary. Thank Very you, right. Councillor Outen. Thank you, Chair. Just um, apologies to Councillor Henson. Um, how many, out of interest, I didn't see the email, um, how many uh, vehicles did they count, or did you count on that count? Mm -hmm. 136. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's without the numbers that uh, Councillor Cole mentioned. Yeah, that's without it. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Tucker. I was really pleased that we've now got representation on the, on the bus group and the one that I'm constantly being lobbied on and certainly we get asked more in the GIC than anything else is a route to Castle Kerry train station. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. That we can get a proper link to, to the railway link. Good idea. I think that Somerset County Council have only just realised that the canals are not working. But, uh, <laughs> Councillor Coles. Thank you, Worcester. Uh, this one's for you, uh, you Worcester. You've been a St. John's um, councillor. Um, a month ago, I reported a large willow tree causing problem in Lowerside Park, which is Mendip's ownership. Um, they own that willow tree. If the rugby club gates are closed, Amazons can't go in there to meet the air amateurs. So they're going into Lowerside Park. And when, when they come in, it's breaking off all the branches on that huge willow tree and going into two people's gardens. Can you recall I mentioned it last? It's attached um, to my email, right? If you yes. Have to look. So uh, nothing's been done about it. Um, I presume the tree officer has been informed, but I, I, I can't confirm it because I don't know. I shall um, talk to the tree officer about it and... Uh, Apparently it was going to be done about 18 months ago, but the COVID put a pay to that during lockdown. So would you, we, we would like the tree to be... Um, it needs to be pruned, pruned very yeah. heavily. It has been done before, uh, eight or nine years ago. But willows are fast-growing uh, species. <laughs> Would, would you be happy to send me any... Have you sent an email to anyone about about it? Um, I spoke to Claire Dickens. Claire Dickens. OK. And, and that, that's on the, the, my internet as well. She did acknowledge it. OK. I shall follow up with Claire. And okay. thank, you. thank you, John. She does know about it. So, councillors, any other questions? We now move on to um, the motions. Motion 10A... Proposed by Councillor Smythe, seconded by Councillor McDougall. Yes, right. Councillor Smythe, would you wish to speak to this motion? Uh, just, just very briefly, thank you, thank you um, Chair. Um, just to mention that the elections are going to be either next May or the May after. 
So I would like to change slightly the wording of this motion to us, rather than the 30th of May 2022 to uh, put in the, the next iteration of this council. Those very words. Those very words. So the motion would read, this, is in, this motion, by the way, is, has been presented before to this council, and it's in order to support and encourage candidates from lower income brackets, um, such as single parents, to put their names forward as candidates become councillors. Um, um, so the, this motion reads, this council supports the introduction of an allowance for all Glastonbury town councillors of £1,000 per annum as from the next iteration of this council, for the reasons just mentioned. Thank you. Councillor McDougall, would you wish to speak to this motion now or at the end of any debate? Uh, I'll comment at the end, maybe. Thank you. Would anybody like to speak against this motion? I would like to ask uh, a Councilor question, Cox. if I may. Does there any other town councillors in our area, in Mendit area, uh, receive an allowance? I, I, I know we've received allowance up at Mendit, but I'm referring to the town councils. So pa parish councils have an allowance given to them in law, should they choose to receive it. The allowance is actually set by the same body that sets the allowance for district councillors. The only difference being that the district councillors have to have it and the parish councillors have to elect to have it. So this is, I think, why the motion's there. It does lead me to one thing, Councillor Smythe, is that the amount of allowance will be dictated by a statutory instrument rather than us. So do you wish to amend your... I'm happy to amend it accordingly. Right, so in, in line with the parish council's allowances or something like that would make sense. So I now see... Councillor Coles, would you wish to come back on this? Um, uh, yes, you did actually ask... Um, answer my question. Does any other town councillors in Mendip, including uh, Froome, Shepton Mallet, I think, um, get an allowance? Councillor McDo, were you wishing to answer that question? I seem to remember last time we discussed it, but Somerton. 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 Councillor Cottle. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Okay, I want to talk to this one in particular uh, because I, I saw it there, and I, the first thing I thought, Really, does that seem like a good idea at this moment in time? And then I went away and I drove around for the day, as I do quite often, chewing things over in my mind. And I came back and I thought, yes, it is a good idea, but not necessarily wholeheartedly for the reasons that you've stated, um, Mike. And I should imagine that it, uh, other town councils will be looking at this since we're in Somerset because... We're going to be doing away with district council councils, yeah. okay? There is going to be more responsibility for a town councillor, regardless of whatever you think, there will be, because people will, uh, we will have councillors uh, on the unitary council, but there will be, I'm pretty sure, that town councillors will receive some of the, the, not the flack, some of the queries and he pleads for help that we as district councillors receive on a regular basis. I can see this coming, uh, it's definitely coming down the line. And I thought, well, a thousand pounds is 20 pounds a week. It's not a huge amount of money. And so I thought, yeah, that, that would sound about right. That's about two hours uh, on minimum wage or something like that, on the living wage. Uh, to put into a week. Well, I do more than that, just even thinking about council meetings. So um, I didn't think it was a, a hugely excessive amount. And then it also dawned on me, sort of a, a little spark went off in my mind, that at Mendip and the other district councils, and obviously at county council, there is a distinction between being a committee chairman and a portfolio holder who receives a slightly higher number. Now, it, went, it did go through my mind that we should be looking at this, or we should be asking somebody to look at it for us, maybe, that 
the chairman of the of the large committees and the mayor because the mayor allowance that you receive at the moment is not for your own uh, personal time no. it is to use as the mayor and that's a difference and so I think that would need to, that needs to be looked into as well so I would suggest that we have a full overhaul by the independent body that you were suggesting and they'll come back with the, the answer uh, to our questions. Sorry, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. I, I think, Councillor uh, Smythe, that you may wish to, to put um, allowance for orgasmic cancers in line with the independent body. I think that, that might be the, the most appropriate um, per annum as from the next iteration of this council. Would you be happy with that? Um, Be very happy with those words. Yeah. That's thank you for those words. Yeah. Thank you. And so, so, anyone else wish to speak to this? So, Councillor Outen, Councillor Barnett, and then Councillor Coles. Thank you. Um, I, I don't. Sorry, I can hear you. I don't want to um, speak in opposition to this because I can see the merits of it and I understand what uh, uh, Nick was saying about it as well. But I, I have some reservations, and and they they link to the fact that. Um, we do this uh, job really for the love of it, love of the community, and, and, and we listen to the residents' um, thoughts and opinions. And I, I would like to ask if, if, if there was a way that we could ask what the residents think about this and engage their kind of uh, opinion on it in some form. Um, and I just wanted to bring that to the table. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Barnett. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to um, do two parts. I really support uh, Councillor Cottle's suggestion of actually reviewing it and looking at it in terms of the changes <coughs> that may, might come. I think that it's, um, I live on a state pension and it actually makes it very difficult when I have expenses that I have to cover that if there was an allowance, that would just be an automatic thing, and it, it becomes a kind of issue. <coughs> and I have to say, in the year that I was deputy mayor, I became quite resentful about it. But um, every other form of volunteer organisation, whether it's um, charitable, or um, mutual or cooperative has a system that actually was approved by a government um, committee in the 1970s that I had the honour to sit on, which was saying that people should not be out of pocket for the work they undertake for organisations. And I would really uh, in that sense, support this. I think it's quite unreasonable um, not to be doing this when the opportunity is there to, for those of us on lower income. When I, somebody said to me, but you probably have a private pension. When I started work, single women were not offered private pensions unless you were a doctor or a solicitor, and even then it was really hard work. And, of course, if you're self-employed and in a rural area, you're often not earning very much, so you don't have that opportunity. And I think it limits not having clarity about it. It limits um, people's idea of standing, particularly because of the amount of work that can be involved on occasions. So that's what I wish to say. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Keary. Thank you, Worship. I'd like to speak against this motion. Um, it's easy enough to say that we should be spending money, but if this, if this particular one had gone through, £16,000 would be added to the precept, just straight off without any consultation with our residents or anything else, as Councillor Evan has said, perhaps we'd ask them what they think. It's been mentioned, uh, I think I've been on the council over 30 years. I cannot remember. I regard it as being a service to the town. I give my labour in terms of meetings that I attend and whatever else I do as part of my service to the town and that is why I stood for the council to do some work for the town. 
if I were having, I don't think I've ever had any real out-of-pocket expenses over 30 years, and I would agree that if there are out-of-pocket expenses, then there should be claims made for it, and we do have in the budget uh, a budget to pay claims of people who are out-of-pocket expenses, and we know of occasions where councillors who have perhaps difficulties have been given grants from the council to enable them to take part fully in council meetings. So we have within our budget, and if you look at the various headings that we have, there are monies available specifically for the mayor has been made. They're, they're not for his personal... Uh, no, they're not for his use. They're, they're, they're not for him, his personal. He's not out of pocket when he takes on the mayor. It may be that he is, but that should be claimed through other expenses. Um, I think that I'd like to know, first of all, how many people have actually been out of pocket and have been claimed. And I would think, and haven't claimed, then they should have claimed. And I would like to think that actually we would have a period of perhaps when councillors would put in claims and let's see what the level is of, of expenses that people are incurring and what they're for and whether they're regarded as legitimate within the work of the council. And after a period of actually reviewing that, then we would know roughly what this amount should be. And uh, I think that would make it more logical than just saying we need something when perhaps many councillors don't uh, and putting it onto the uh, ratepayers. And I think it would be better if we had a proper review, as has been said, but with, with actual monies being put in as expenses, so as we know what it is costing in genuine expenses, rather than going to anybody and saying, we will, we will put what they say and put that on the right page. Of the let's, let's have a proper view, let's people submit the offences over a six month period, let's say, and then we could judge what might be the monies that would be reasonable if indeed we decide to go ahead uh, to the body of the points. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Roney Dougal. Yes. Well, I completely agree with, with John Cleary about the fact that um, I do this as a service to the community and I'm very happy for my life to be in service for the planet and for the benefit of all beings. I can remember when I was quite a new councillor um, and I had my grandchildren to stay and I had to employ a childminder and I asked if it were possible for me to be refunded the money I was paying the childminder and I was basically laughed out of court that um, one didn't receive money for such a thing. Um, and so whilst um, John Cleary says that yes, one can put in a claim, I was told that I couldn't put in a claim, that there was no such money available. So I totally support this motion because I think that people like Sue and myself who are living on state pensions um, and who are out of pocket quite frequently on very many different various things um, should actually have some recourse to some sort of independence. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Much. Uh, yeah, <coughs> thank you, Roger. The only thing that makes me a little uncomfortable in this way is the thought that, uh, take MPs for example, they get a lot of flack, particularly if they make a decision which benefits themselves. And there's a kind you know, they've come up with, it's not even like they've got an employer that, that does it. And I'm a bit, I'd be uncomfortable with a parallel situation where the public had not been consulted. And then people said, well, I mean, the council have just awarded all their councillors a load of money. Regardless, I don't know whether your plan envisaged it being everybody would get it or you could opt in for it or say, no, I don't need it. You know, because obviously some people don't. I don't, I'm not overwhelmed by the argument that people who are on the edge financially would make the decision on the basis of, say, this figure, which is £1,000 a year, whether that would make the difference. They're probably very busy bringing up children, possibly, or whatever. But I can't see it making that much difference to somebody. So certainly without public consultation, I'd be a bit wary of supporting something like this. If all the public said, yeah, certainly, I'd be astonished for one thing. I feel a little bit more comfortable about supporting the motion at, at the moment. I'm a little bit iffy about that's kind of where I am. <clears throat> Thank you. Councillor McDougall, do you wish to, to speak to this? Mm. You know that we have agreed to only speak once about an item. So. 
I'll take my turn. Yes. I haven't spoken yet. As a, but you're the seconder of the motion. That's. Oh, who wants to? Oh yeah, carry on. <laughs> so, uh, can, do you wish to wait to the end? That's what I'm asking you, Councillor. Uh, I might as well, yeah. Thank you. So, Councillor Tucker and then Councillor Coles. Thank you, Worship. Well, I'm happy to support an amendment if, if that was what's being proposed that we should look at the expenses and make sure when we set the precept this time that people are recompensed for things that are reasonable costs that they incur on behalf of the council. But I think in a time when people are encouraged to volunteer, then we're sending a totally wrong message in terms of this council suddenly thinking they're going to get money. And I think that we'd be totally wrong to raise the precept by £16,000 to make sure that everybody had £1,000. I can remember as a, a young councillor with a young family and a fledging business, and I didn't have any money, but I did have the time, and I was happy to spend my time here trying to represent the people that I thought had a view in Glastonbury. And I think that's what we come here to do is not, not about the funds. I agree that people shouldn't be out of pocket, but I, I certainly don't agree with this this idea of sort of getting an allowance of £1,000. So if, if you're proposing an amendment to this, that we review it in view of that, so that when we set our preset this year, there is, if you were saying that you were told there was no money, then we make sure that there is a, a, po a pocket of money and all the councillors are aware of it. Then I think that will be a reasonable act going forward. But I would, uh, I would, I will vote against this if, if this goes through as a proposal. And I would ask for it actually to be a, a, a named vote, or a recorded vote. Thank you. Um, so we, the, um, you've got an, an amendment. That's been sprung on me, Your Worship. So I haven't thought about the wording of the amendment. I think Councillor Cottle made the initial point that there should be a re review of um, expenses. Yeah, basically. It's, it's so it's not, it's not an amended motion, it's a, it's a new motion. It's, a, it's actually a, a, a different motion, isn't it? Um, well, that we can say rather than an allowance of, of a, a point made by whoever the body is that, that allocates allowances, that this council should review its um, system of uh, expenses and decide how best to move forward. Jared, are you happy? Are you happy that you? Uh, uh, the next iteration. Uh, uh, at the budget meeting coming up. So the next iteration of the. <coughs> so uh, well, just to, could, could we just wait a moment? I just wanted to see whether the. Clark has taken down the words of the amendment. I think what well, we're, where you think, I think you're going, and I want clarity, is <coughs> having an independent body to look at, at the opportunity to reclaim the expenses, legitimate expenses of uh, individuals should they arise. I think that's what you're asking. Yeah. Correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, no, I, I'm, I don't think that was what Councillor Kiri was saying. That's your I, 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 my point was, and a couple of councillors have made, that we shouldn't be doing anything. We're consulting the electorate, if you like, or the, as, as to whether they feel we should be uh, rewarded in any way, other than through a system of claiming expenses if they are made, rather than an amount being put on us by an independent body or anybody else. That this council should decide what's an appropriate level of monies to have in precept so that out reasonable out of pocket expenses incurred by councillors in, in the course of their duty can be reimbursed. So I'm, I'm going to look to standing orders here. That might be a more appropriate motion to take before the Finance and General Purposes meeting rather than here tonight. And I would look as this is, this is clearly a motion that is um, there's no clear support or, or um, uh, detraction is that whether or not you would like to um, remove the motion this evening be, um, because if we did go to a vote on, on it 
and it was unsuccessful, we would not be able to approach it again for six months. And if there's an election in May, we will never be approaching it. I'm very happy to take that advice and refer it to the Finance General Purposes Committee. Thank you. So, thank you. So we, we withdraw that motion and we will um, look to the Finance and General Purposes Meeting to review the allowance situation because I, and I wonder whether the clerk would be able to prepare for, the, for that committee so a, a short briefing on what we currently do around allowances because I certainly remember Councillor Serena Rowney Dougal being unable to claim uh, allowances for a cost that she incurred to come to a meeting. So councillors, we move on to motion B10B. May I be excused? Yes, because of course. Yes, thank, you, thank you very much. And yes, Councillor Bishop too. Thank you. Oh, cheers, Clive. Yeah. Can I raise a point of order before you go into points, motions B, C and D? By yes, of course. Um, I, I was away last week when the motions were presented to the clerk to be included in this agenda, and if I had been in the office, I would have had a conversation with the proposer of the motion that I believe that as the council has already a climate emergency declaration, you already have an ecological emergency declaration, you are already earth protector status, and you already have an environment strategy which is reviewed annually, I would have suggested <coughs> that each of those motions, B, C and D, that don't need to come to, to discussion again, you have already endorsed as a council the, the, uh, the, the line you wish to take. And I would have thought it could have been an instruction to the clerk's office to have uh, written to cover those three points that are requested in there. In a similar way that we've talked about an instruction to write to the county council. Indeed. I see. Indeed. On the grounds that you've already covered off the, uh, the all those motions that have previously been passed. So I'm looking to the proposal of the motions for response to the clerk's input. Having had a discussion with the clerk this morning, and the second of these motions, I'm very happy to take that um, direction uh, and present with the, present the clerk and yourself with the words necessary to write in writing to these um, bodies in support of the. the so you're withdrawing the, withdrawing the motions on. So I'm withdrawing all motions on that basis. Thank so you. So happy with that. So in in the same way that we looked at writing to the county council. Are we, as a council, just happy to support the clerk writing to um, uh, to support? Who would who would you write the first letter to? By the way, I don't the first sure. I've got details of, of this. The first letter would be to our MP. Oh, I see. Right, thank you. The second letter would be to our MP, the Prime Minister, and Alok Sharma, President of COP26. Yes. And that would be the same for the third letter but also including the Local Government Association and Association of Directors for Environment, Economy, Planning and Transport, who also support. So, councillors, you just heard who we would write to with these requests, to, which are in line, uh, as the clerk says, with motions we've already passed, and I would suppose... Aye. 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 Thank Aye. you. Yeah. We now move on to receive the Budget Monitoring Report, which... Uh, is uh, really item 11, but seems to be mysteriously without an item number. Councillor, does anyone wish to speak to this? Very helpful situation. Yeah. Yeah. It's very heavy. I'll note it as far as I can. So, Councillor, shall we note the report? Thank you. We move on to what is item 11, but I suspect is actually item 12, which is to receive a schedule of payments. Any comments on schedule of payments? Any queries? Um, whilst the councillors are looking, I would just like to ask the clerk, item 1049, Amberol, hanging baskets, 
was this paid from monies that we received from the town deal? It was, Your Worship, and you know from the previous report on the budget monitoring, some items were paid for in this financial year, and, and that was one of them. But Amber, I stand corrected on that. I, I, sorry, I might give you misinformation on just that. What we did buy was three larger containers, two for the bottom of both town and one to go in Butts Close Car Park. Right. And I think it's the two for the bottom of both town that are there. So the water tanks. They're, they're, the, they're the large tanks that have the lining, so you oh, yeah. fill the lining yeah. with water. Yeah. And so they, they would come out of the in-bloom budget. Thank you very much for clearing that up. Any other questions to the schedule of payment? Councillor, do I have your agreement to sign this off as uh, stated? Thank you. And whilst I do that, we move on to reports from advisory committees. Councillor Tucker, Frost Fair. Thank you, Worship. Well, as you know, you're all aware that Frost Fair is now fast approaching, um, 27th. Um, we are looking for volunteers for the morning of the Frost Fair to help set the stalls out. We'll, we'll have it. We'll have it marked up as previously. Um, in fact, it'll run pretty well as previously, hopefully. But we do need people to help locate stall holders on the morning. So I'm looking for volunteers, okay. please. As before. As, yep. many, as before. Aye. And I'm looking around the table. I'll be working. So I can't. I, I'd like to take the top of the town. Where Good. I go. Thank you. Yeah, we were hoping you would. And John, the usual, usual yeah, place. Sure. And Stephen, the marketplace. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Did, did you do Benedict Street, Brian? I think. And the yeah. market yeah. does, yeah. didn't you? I usually yeah. do Benedict Street with John. No, no, I did the High Street. John did the High oh, Street. Do you? Oh. Perhaps do the Benedict Street with Brian Craig. That Mike and Lindsay could probably do Magdalene Street then. That would be grand. I Thank think you. that covers it all pretty well, doesn't it? Yeah. So so that bit's fairly covered. Um, I think that and Serena was just running through with me the various acts. We've we've actually I think we told you but we're actually going to engage with Archer's Way this time and that, that's gonna have some Excellent. activity. The church is opening up, St John's now with fully reopened and that's going to have various activities in there. Um, there is going to be the lantern procession for the children this time to come down and light the tree. So all we're relying on now is Denny to make the weather good for us again. And I think that we're going to, we should, we should have a good event. So um, I think that's all I need to say on that. Wish. Thank you. Thank you very much to you and... Uh, Serena Rowney Dougal, thank you for. Just a very quick one. I've had uh, uh, emails today from the headmaster, headmistress, I beg your pardon, of St. Lunds School, and they're offering up their um, car park as additional oh, yes. car parking. So there will be a little bit less pressure on that part of the town. Mm -hmm. I thought I'd share that with you. Thank you very much. Glastonbury in bloom. Councillor Smythe, you're down against this, are you? Uh, I don't know why. I think I should be down against <laughs> this if the. I think so. Yes. So um, I would just say that um, Glastonbury and Bloom, um, the presentations on the 15th of October were absolutely fantastic and a wonderful displays this year. Um, I have learned one thing, that uh, I need to pre-sign all of these certificates if I'm ever mayor again. <laughs> uh, and it was, it was brilliant and we, went, uh, members of the committee went um, with Claire to visit the Fishers Hill planting scheme and it's an absolutely fantastic thing Claire's doing there. Some great volunteers working as well. So thank you very much Claire for all your hard work there. And um, we are, I'm unsure what the next meeting is but uh, I'm sure it's pretty soon. Councillor Coles. Uh, just briefly going back to the frost fair. Um, Herbie's Field would be used for car parking. Are we going to charge cars for going in there? We are. Do you know much per car? Roughly? Oh. Okay, so donation of £3. Thank you. Suggested donation of £3 minimum. And so just on that point, how are we making known 
for example, the St. Dunstan's car park is going to be available so that people coming into the town would know to go in there if they were coming in the west direction. Herbie's Phil, do you mean? No, no St. Dunstan's no. School. School, school, sorry. School, it was just mentioned. And, and the fact that Herbie's Field is available as well. Um, uh, how, how will we be uh, to the, the public aware that they're there? Terry. Okay. Signage. It's all in my office. There's a whole heap of signage for the, um, and the carnival club are involved in pointing people towards the park and ride. So they're doing the yellow slide and jumping on the steel boards. The concern is that once Herbie's field is full, we don't want to be sending people there and finding that it's right. So I have the signs made up that will go in front of those, we'll say car park's full, and then encourage people to give consideration to using public transport from either streets or wells. Yeah. That's another way of doing it. But what the specific question, Councillor, was that of St. Dunstan's school. Yeah. Um, I've only had that email today, but it'll be down to the school to, to, uh, to make time, it yeah. known that, that they're, they have that car park facility. I, I can't be directing people there. Okay. Um, nope. It'll be down to them to do that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so um, we now move to Climate Emergency Advisory Committee. Councillor Rony Do. Okay, so um, we had a really good meeting. Um, Melissa talked about her work with the new consultant, Nigel Griffiths, who has 25 years of experience on heritage buildings um, for refitting and for decarbonisation programmes. And they will also look, whilst they're looking for the long-term solution, they'll also be looking for an interim backup if needed, if the gas boiler does decide that it's had enough um, and we need something. So that is all in hand which was really good to hear. Um, then we talked about the, the COP26, the, the, um, the seminar on the 3rd of November. So, Mike, if you want to tell people about that, please do so. Um, and then we've had the open day, as people will know about today, down in the small town hall. And I just spoke with Melissa before I came up, and she said it had been really well attended, that they had lots of suggestions from different people for things that... They think that we, we could do to help make the town resilient. Um, and so it's fulfilled the function that it was set up for. Um, and we will be discussing the suggestions at the next climate emergency meeting, and I'll bring them to the town council as appropriate. So that felt really good. Um, then there was talk about the rewilding. Well, we've already heard about Fishers Hill and how well that is going. Um, and Rachel met with Nick here, who said that he would help with regard to the Windmill Hill rewilding to get that sorted with, with Mendip. So let's hope that that one goes ahead. They are planting bulbs um, on the, the bit up top of Lake of Mutton behind the bus stop. So it's mm -hmm. a, just a place to start. <coughs> They've consulted with all the local neighbours around, local people have been helping them plant the bulbs. So that is going well. Um, the Glass to be on Foot programme, there was an initial meeting um, and Susanna was going to get signatures at the open day today in order to join the Walkers Are Welcome group, which is a national group for um, people, encouraging people to walk around towns. Um, and she needs 500 signatures, so I don't know how well she did because she'd already gone by the time I checked in just before the meeting, but um, we'll find out about that. People have been asking how well the Sunlit Solar has been going. Um, Mike is really pleased. He's had 10 properties that he's already um, looked at and is going to be installing on over the next couple of months. He's got 10 more properties in line for him to go and check out with the people. Um, and he's got people coming in all the time. So we've done really well with that program. And I do know that there are some people who are looking at his costs, looking, checking with others, and some people are going to sell the streets rather than him, as the idea was that the choice is for the people, but we were going to support Mike. Um, so I can say that we've done really well with that. Great. Um, and I think the people of Glastonbury are really going to benefit from what we've done with that. And I just wanted to let you know, this was just something I told the meeting when I was in the library. They are closing in order to have the building decarbonised. In other words, they are going to have a carbon neutral library wow. building here in Glastonbury. Amazing. And I thought that was really good news that it's not just the town council trying to get the town hall and our buildings carbon neutral, but it's actually happening in other public buildings around the town. 
So I felt like I was a good news person this morning. Thank you very much. So we now move to reports from outside bodies, the Towns Fund, Councillor Tucker. Thank you, Your Worship. So we, we know, unfortunately, the, the, uh, the Town Fund dreaded lurgy struck the, the chair as, as well now, so I'm afraid we've, we've got a, a, a well, I'm not afraid, we have got a new temporary chair for the Towns Fund, um, Lynn Sedgmore, who probably some of you know, um, and she took the last meeting. And at the last meeting, it was decided that I did talk to the council about the fact that we were going to try and set up this legacy so that some, there's something beyond the, the town deal fund. And it was agreed that they would set up a community benefit society. society. I've got to read my own writing now. Um, without any charity status, that was, the, that was the term that it's going to be set up as. Um, we had a presentation of various options and it was deemed by the board that that was going to be the most suitable way to go forward. Uh, we've also, as you heard tonight, the groups are starting to work up schemes and I think it was really confusing to listen to the sports cluster, but I can assure you that other groups are doing the same sort of thing. And we're all having to work to the green book that we keep hearing about. And I did express at the board the fact that there was a problem in the council of councillors actually understanding that. So Julie Ritter Sullivan has promised to come and talk to the council and explain to everybody exactly how this works. But it does seem as it's now panning out that if your scheme is sound and they, they have taken on consultants, which are projects forward, so it, it's going to be it's going to be hard work, isn't it? And it's good. I mean, the, the Burke Committee are meeting once, twice, fortnightly to to get us through the the sort of decision making. A bit like if you remember when we were doing the the sort of the, the early money that we had that we were spending. So there is a lot of work to do, but I think that it's quite clear from the enthusiasm of the sports group that these things are really going to make a difference in the town and I think it's also really important for us to A, encourage all the groups to engage with the District Council and make sure that they do work their way through this Green Book because the only way they'll get their money is if we run through the process but also for people in the town and if you hear people saying oh they're going to do this and do that it's likely that people are considering because part of the business case must be you must look at all the alternatives. You must just set your heart on one outcome. You've got to look at various outcomes and then decide which is, and, and hopefully if we follow the route of the Green Book, we should finish up with a business case that A, satisfies the government, but which also will be sustainable in the future. So there is, there is a process that we all be encouraged to go through and there is the professional help to get us there, but it is going to be some hard work to achieve it. Councillor, can I just ask, um, will Julie be coming to speak to us at our subcommittee meeting of the um, Property and Assets, uh, our Town Deal Board meeting on the uh, 16th, our Town Council Town Deal? I'm, I'm not sure no. is the answer to that, Your Worship. I think we needed to, the clerk was away and I think we need to set a date because I was unsure of the council's dates. So. Yes, so I mean I think I think listening to uh, you talk about the amount of work that Bert are doing, we, we as a council need to be on the pulse of our own projects and mm -hmm. keeping that quite a regular meeting as well. Um, but I see that it's scheduled for Tuesday the 16th at 8 o'clock, is that correct, Joe? The next meeting of our town deal subcommittee, looking at our projects. Um, okay, I was going to get to that in a second. Your wish, I'll do it right now. The um, the next meeting of the town deal subcommittee was meant to have been tomorrow evening, but I haven't had a chance to get the agendas out, and because of my enforced absence, there isn't that much to bring forward. So I'm going to suggest that we, we include the item on the full property assets committee meeting for the following week, the 16th, and, and then if there's a need to have a, a, a subcommittee meeting quickly, we can set it up on that evening. 
Is, is that the property and assets Chair, meeting? Chair, there is, there is one down for the 16th after the planning Yes, meeting. I think, Chair, I think. That's the full property yeah. assets. Uh, 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 subcommittee. Subcommittee. Uh, yes, uh, I think uh, it was uh, always uh, going to uh, be. Uh, Where's the full property assets? We don't know. It was going to be tomorrow. Uh, it was property and assets it was going to be tomorrow. So, it's, yeah. the, so the agenda that I've done for next week is the full property and assets committee meeting, with, um, which is going to be after planning. The town deal. That, that was listed as the town deal meeting. Yes, so I think we might have to reschedule the, the, the property and assets meeting. Uh, there's some items on that agenda, work your worship, that, that we want to be aired very quickly, as I've discussed with the chair already. Well, how, I see. About, how about if we have property and assets on the 16th and then the, the subcommittee the following Tuesday on the 23rd? Is, is that free? That's finance and general purposes. Oh, uh, yeah. Perhaps um, if if we could um, try to have at least touch base with the subcommittee during the night of the 16th, that yeah. might be useful just uh, for us to at least perhaps listen to the reflections of uh, other councillors who are already involved in writing plans about what we as a council need to think about. I'm Council wondering, Sue. could we not have a meeting on a Wednesday if the Tuesdays are all full? Because we used to have property and assets on a Wednesday. Thank you, Worship. It would be really useful to have Judy Ritter Sullivan here yeah. to, for, mm -hmm. to, to explain, and that could be the bit that's going to decide which date that meeting is. Yeah. Okay. I would suggest we carry on with the property and assets meeting if that's what the clerk's got arranged, and for him to try and arrange to get Julie Reader Sullivan here as soon for as. the group yeah, for, okay. the, for our working meeting, because I think that would be much more fruitful. Yeah. Okay. Councillor Cottle? Yeah, I've got a question for Councillor Tucker, actually. He may be able to, to, to enlighten me on something that came to me today. Uh, has, the, um, has a person from Montreal been employed? Or something with the uh, with the bids yeah. or something because I was told I was told today that um, by a councillor that uh, a person from Montreal had been employed uh, to mediate on some of the plans. Do you know anything about this? Because it really quite, quite confused me, and actually, and I couldn't quite understand, get the grip of what I was being told. Yes, there is a mediator who's been appointed. And there's a Zoom meeting with the mediator, with with two of the projects. Okay. And this mediator lives in Montreal. Yeah, because it's a Zoom meeting. This is the wonder of technology. Yeah. 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 Yes. That is correct. Okay, thank you. That's correct. Thank you. I, I, looking at the time, I think perhaps it's time to move on to the next item on the yeah. agenda, which is communications and announcements. Um, Remembrance Day Parade is on Sunday the 14th, Remembrance mm -hmm. Sunday. Gerard, are we going to meet here at 10.30? Yes. Uh, as their Remembrance Day parade, Armistice Day is this Thursday, and there will be a, a, a short uh, address, not address, the wrong word, two-minute silence and the commemoration, commend, commendation at the War Memorial on, at 11 o'clock on uh, this Thursday. Um, but the Remembrance Day Parade I wanted to share with you. Uh, the detail of that is now uh, sorted. The, there will be less groups parading because a lot of the youth groups haven't met and some of them are still nervous about the, um, the COVID legislation. But there is the, the, our procession is to be led by the town band or the Basley Brass and the, um, uh, the gathering will be in here in the town, uh, in the chamber here with the idea of being prepared to parade at 10.30, but actually leaving at quarter to 11 to take ourselves to the church. And then we, for those parading, will attend the, the, the service, uh, which will be a service of remembrance in St. John's, and then we will put the parade back. And uh, that, that's on Sunday morning. Worship. Thank you. Um, whilst on my feet, can I think I'm going to three yes, of course. I make? Frost has already been covered, so I'll move on from that one. Um, I, I thought I was going to bring you some really good news this evening, but it's been tainted by bringing you some good news to some sad news. Is that at long last we have the defibrillator in Fairfield at the base of the tour. 
but sadly it was only there for two weeks before it was vandalised. Oh, okay. And it has been made inoperable. So when you caught me looking at my text just a moment ago, yeah, where yeah. I was trying to get an update from Hartshore um, on the situation, and uh, that gentleman, Lawrence, is coming over tomorrow. Uh, he's having, uh, the police have an idea who's, who did it, but not enough evidence from which to, uh, to, to do any work on that. And then two other items, very quickly. One I've got on here. The next meeting is one of the things that needs to be discussed reasonably quickly at the next meeting of property assets is that there is a big issue with the lighting down on the skate park. Um, I'm just going to flag it up, not have any debate now, that's a property assets one. But the quote that I've received from the electrician to repair the light, not repair, to, to renew the lighting is £9,000. So just be aware of that's what's coming up next week. And then finally, you've already touched on it, is that the meeting tomorrow night of the Chidmo Diary is now not happening. So no meeting tomorrow night. Okay, thank you, Richard. Thank you. Um, are there any other announcements? Councillors, I just want to say briefly that I attended on the 6th of November the Global Day of Action around COP26. I attended a meeting of many Somerset Parish and Town Councils at Edgar Hall in Somerton. The meeting was called Scope Somerset COP 26 Plus. And Melissa gave a presentation there with Bruton's retrofit officer, which is who's an amazing person, looking at how to best retrofit houses, the housing stock in Bruton, so that they are as efficient in insulation and functioning as possible. Bruton uh, Council uh, raised funds from the Environment Fund from Somerset to do this. Quite remarkable plan they've got going. Melissa was brilliant telling people about what's happening here with Glastonbury. We also had Cara Naden, who was the South Somerset Environmental Advisor for the, the District Council there. She did a workshop based on Glastonbury's environmental charter. And we also had the environment officer from Froome. Together, they, the four of them are quite a formidable team. I like to think of them as a fantastic four for Somerset. It, what was very clear from that meeting is that many of the parish councils have not even begun to think about this, or town councils. I was asked to sum up at the end, giving a final speech. I talked about two things. One, what it means to be one degree or 1.5 degree above the pre-industrial carbon in the atmosphere. We've already reached one degree in 2015. 1.5 of the target will mean that most of Somerset will be flooded by the end of the century, 1.5. Tonight, the government's targets of everything that's been agreed at COP will get us to 2.4. 2.4 will be a complete disaster by the end of the century. And that's what we're heading into. So it's really important. That was brought home to the parishes there. I think a lot of people had a bit of a wake-up call as to what it really means for Somerset. We're so low, it's going to be devastating. I then talked about the work that we've done as a council since adopting an environmental charter in 2019, and the various things that we've done. And I could see that we were a visible inspiration to everyone there. The calls now for a Somerset-wide environmental charter based upon our charter, and the councillors are going to follow many of our motions as model motions, including things like the fact that we banned glyphosate and, and stuff like that. We, we, whilst I know that some members of this council even questioned the logic of um, reason of why we were doing things. I think it will become more and more clear why we're doing things. But we, we really are in a terrible situation as regards to climate. The, the results of COP26 will mean a 2.4 degrees rise in carbon emissions by the end of the century. Google what that means and you will have a shock. So I just wanted to let you know about that. On a, on a brighter note, we had a great event downstairs as well. So that was good. Over 100 people came today oh. and it was really inspiring. And um, so we need to keep on with this. Any other announcements? Yeah, Your Worship, if I may. Um, most of the councillors were invited to have a walk around the town with 
true speed. I attended. Um, I was very disappointed there was low attendance in our town councils. Liz um, attended, and it was really, really very informative. Um, if anyone wants to know anything more about it, um, there's an email address here, www.one.network slash UK. Give you an up-to-date information. You may be able to see it without putting that um, address up. We're a local company based in the heart of Bath with in-house customer care team. Um, I've got dates here when the next roads are going to be dug up. Um, December, Glasby North, April, Artist Way, or March, Windmill Hill, February, Triple Street, January, Beckery Road. And most of Windmill Hill already. Have they? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, in May, Abbey Park, North Low Street. In June, I think that's a bad, bad time of the year, Glasby Marketplace. And um, that's basically it. It was well worth um, doing this and meeting up the team, who's all the engineers who's doing all the work. Very, very informative. Nothing was mentioned about 5G. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, apparently, it's going to be so fast, it'll be faster than a strike of lightning. That's what it says. That's very good. I, I <laughs> must say that other internet providers yeah. are available. Nice lunch. Councillor Barnett. Um, I just briefly like to report we did um, uh, have the uh, um, discussion at our last meeting about the pardon for Abbott Whiting. And I'd like to report that Amanda, who um, is behind this and who raised it with us initially, uh, sent me a copy of an email that she has received from Dr. Rowan Williamson, who was Archbishop of Canterbury, saying that he had always felt that a great injustice had been incurred with Abbott Whiting, and he was very uh, complimentary to Amanda for starting uh, this petition for a pardon. Thank you. I, I hate to steal your thunder, but Amanda contacted me this afternoon to say that another former Archbishop of Canterbury, George Carey, has also just signed the petition, and there are several members of the House of Lords who have signed it as well, and it is picking up momentum. With that calibre of folk signing it, I think we may see something interesting happen next yeah. year. Very good. Councillors, is there any correspondence, Sharon? The only correspondence that received, Your Worship, is a letter you and I have both received to do with Fisher's Hill, which I think we need to discuss outside. Thank you. News releases. Could we um, say something about our successful COP26 events? I, I think Melissa might write something for that. Any actions arising from this meeting? Worship, the, um, worship, the actions from this meeting are to reconvene at the flight and date to the neighbourhood plan meeting in early December uh, to chase the police report and circulate on the arrival. To you all, most importantly, is to write a letter of support for the water problem at Eggerley, uh, and that there's a number of sub actions from that, um, particularly for right to Peter Hobley, Hobley, Hobley um, to do with the Rowley Hill, Windmill Hill footpath closure, mm -hmm. and, and then. Further, we have discussion about we have right the highways about the Basketfield Lane, Main Road, and Eggerly drains blocked, and, and that then extended into Manor House Road. So there's quite a lot of actions on that one. Um, uh, and then an action to put on the next agenda the Old Wells Road traffic management stroke speed, uh, which is to be extended into Windmill Hill. That's to go for the next agenda. Uh, and I think that's it, Your Worship. Thank you. I'm looking at cancellation. Was there any? A uh, letter that we were supposed to write to support you that Gerard hasn't mentioned. Uh, no, I think he's got a good list there. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.
So we we go cancer Serena Roney Dougal, cancer Mike Smythe, and cancer Steve Henderson. So there would, was going to be an action about connecting with Julie Reed Sullivan for the town deal fund. For the... Uh, that's in hand. That didn't need to be an action for this meeting. It's already in hand. Cancer Mike. Uh, uh, gender item on the next um, finance and general purposes committee for the review of expenses. Allowances. Uh, allowances. Yeah. Three three letters to write various bodies with regards to COP26 and supporting the climate in the ecological emergency mm -hmm. bill progressing through Parliament at this time. Thank and you. I will assist with the wording of that. And Melissa's already volunteered that she'll to construct those letters with Gerald's permission. And Sir Henderson. I just want to point out that um, at the start of every meeting, Your Worship, you very uh, handily say that no fire drills are scheduled this evening. Well, I'd just like to say I've never had a fire drill in the 10 years I've been at this. Is that legal? Are we supposed to do them? Or is it just keeping that we need to do? Well, uh, Councillor, you'll remember when we first joined the town council, somebody had to stand and turn the fire alarm for it to work. In response, Your Worship, it is a legal requirement that twice a year the building is evacuated, uh, 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 is the word I'm trying to say. It doesn't have to be at a full council meeting. And if you want it to be a full council meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, just. Just very quickly before we reach the end, one thing that I've noticed is if we did have a fire during this town council meeting and the main stairs were indeed blocked by fire and we had to go out the back, we would find it difficult to reach our muster point because the gates are locked. Just a thought. Mm. Okay. Those go up the window with a rope ladder. Mm. Councillors, I declare the meeting closed. This is nothing to do with the council. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was just Claire was the one that contacted me. Everything ticked off. I mean, I was maybe when I needed to. Yes. yes. Back back back. Back. No, I didn't know what they were telling me about it. So we have, you'll be able to talk later. I'm very passionate about what you're talking about. Then this program on Channel 4 and it was middle way. She was just about to give her one to one. She was just about to give her one to one. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. It's yeah. 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 I'm <laughs> <laughs>